All right, we have our recording started and we're going to kick off our Texas Master Naturalist Virtual Volunteer Fair Day 2. We're excited to have everybody with us this morning again. Um, this is the second day of our, uh, our second virtual volunteer fair held this February 2021. Um, we're excited to have a whole set of presentations and projects presented today, different from the ones that we presented yesterday. Um, giving our Master Naturalist volunteers lots of opportunities to engage with our partners um, and, um, and organizations across the state in conservation volunteer work. Um, so, again, we're excited to have you guys here and we're going to get this rolling. There's a little bit of a delay, so I need to keep that in mind. All right, some quick etiquette before we get started. Always healthy to start off. Um, on the same foot so that we all know um, what the rules are with the virtual volunteer fair meeting etiquette today. Um, your videos have been turned off and attendees cannot unmute. Our speakers will be sharing their videos while they're speaking um, so that their faces are familiar with, um, with their project and you can connect with a person and a face with the project that you'll be volunteering with. Um, again, attendees cannot unmute, but we do have the chat room open so that you can chat with our presenters ask um, questions. We ask that you use the all panelists uh, selection in your chat that helps to make sure that your question gets seen by everybody um, and more eyes on it to be able to get answered quickly. Um, some quick chat room etiquette. Uh, please use clear questions, um, no acronyms. We're not gonna count you off for spelling, um, but try and make that question easy for us to understand so we can ask, um, we are asking the question that you're intending us to ask of the project host today. Um, select chat to everyone or to all panelists. Um, and then we're gonna keep chat related to the presentation topic only. Um, we're gonna make sure that we stay on task today. And then our chat room is being recorded and will be posted post event as well. Um, we are gonna stay on time today. Our agenda is fast and furious. We have 10 minute presentation slots by all of our speakers today with Ms. Judith Green keeping time for us and helping to manage that time. So do know that um, while we will be going fast, this is being recorded and we will post that recording either by the end of the day today or first thing tomorrow morning. Um, and then you're welcome to come and go throughout the day as you um, have seen the agenda posted on the website and gone through the catalog. If there are specific sessions that you want to attend, feel free to pop in and out for those sessions throughout the day. Presenters will be sharing um, a series of information throughout the day today, and all of this information is also captured in their uh, project proposals and the full catalog that is linked in the chat room now. Project descriptions, expectations and outcomes, logistics, any experience or equipment or training that may be needed, obviously the benefits in it for you. They're selling their projects to you as the volunteers to, to join them on their quest or on their, that opportunity if they're presenting. Um, and then some of the other logistics of location and, and contact information as well. All of today's information, I've mentioned it a couple of times, is found on our website. We'll drop that link into the chat room throughout the day. So hopefully it's readily uh, accessible for you today. Um, but our virtual volunteer fair page is where everything is gonna be housed. Even our post event follow up with the survey link and the um, the recordings from yesterday and then from today as well. And I, I've mentioned it a couple of times, but it's worth saying one more time that full catalog does have all of the information that you'll want to know about those projects that you're volunteering for, that you're signing up to commit to volunteering for. Um, and we do have a series of uh, presentations, a series of projects that were not able to be presented due to speaker schedule conflicts um, and those presentations are, are those projects that are still seeking volunteers are put in that catalog. So make sure that you check out that full um, catalog to see all of the different opportunities that are available to you. And then finally, how do you get signed up to volunteer? We'll have a survey monkey link that we'll be dropping in the chat. It's also posted on the website. By signing up for the survey monkey link or the projects at hand, you're saying, I want to volunteer, I'm committing to volunteering for this project. 
Um, our project hosts will be sent to the uh, contact information for everybody who selects their project. Um, by the end of February, we'll be sending it to them throughout the month, but um, we'll be closing the survey at the end of the month of February. Um, and then those project hosts will be responsible for contacting you, getting you set up with that training or additional contact um, if needed, um, and following up with you on those next steps on how to engage in that volunteer project. Um, and please note, um, this happened last time. There were more volunteers than some projects could handle. And so there were, uh, uh, so some of our project hosts had to be uh, deliberative in their selection of volunteers to be able to match the best skill set with their projects at hand. Um, and we will, uh, we're looking into the opportunity of having another virtual volunteer fair later this year, um, and we'll share that information with you as it becomes available. Mary Pearl, we have one question in the Q&A asking about um, where to find the catalog. And if you can go back to that slide, um, just showing them where that's located. So that catalog, is, the link is within that picture of the, uh, the cone flower, purple cone flower. Um, so you'll click on this download catalog link right here. It's under Naturalist News. You'll find that virtual volunteer fair, and then you'll click on that link right there. Um, and we I also post put it in the chat box too, so it's there yeah. as well. Perfect, thank you. How do you get to that page, Carolyn? You go to Naturalist News and you'll find that virtual volunteer fair. I'm gonna post all those links one more time in that chat. Michelle, this yeah, is you. We'll be posting them throughout the day. Okay, so um, the questions that we got, um, we learned some things from our last volunteer virtual volunteer fair, and so um, we got some questions uh, about how to report for attending today or listening in um, to the vol virtual volunteer fair. So we have a little more instruction for you on that this this time this year. Um, so ma our master naturalist membership can get service hours for attending today's event live or listening to the event, the recording of the event afterwards. Um, it's all volunteer service hours. The one thing you're gonna wanna make sure of is that you ensure that you are approved for this service opportunity in the VMS. Um, and if it hasn't, if you haven't already been approved to the opportunity, you can go ahead and sign yourself up. Um, the opportunity has been created at the state level and shared with all of our chapters. So it is there, um, all of your chapters have it. Um, but if you don't see it in your drop down box yet, go ahead and register yourself for this TMN virtual volunteer service fair. And then when you go back and report that you're attending um, this event, either live or recorded, um, you're going to report to that project in your drop down box. And um, the fair is a multi day event, so you can get service for attending or listening into both days. Um, yesterday was day 1 today is our, our last day of the fair um, for the spring event. Um, so you would, you would attend if you attended both days, you would report 2 different dates for attending or if you're listening to different days. Um, you would, you would report 2 different times for attending each of the each of the days or re recording. Um, you would record to the nearest quarter hour. So um, how you can pop in and out all day long for these presentations or fat, you know, if you're watching the recording, fast forward to the one um, that you're most interested in in your area um, and record up to 15 minutes for each of the sessions listen, listened to. Um, and when you do record, um, you would be you would be writing uh, the, the information is that you attended or listened to the recordings of uh, today's events, the virtual volunteer service fair. There are two uh, overall types of project opportunities that will be presented um, yesterday and today. Um, the first type of project opportunity is our, our fully virtual service projects. Um, virtual service projects can are opportunities, service opportunities that can be done um, almost by any master naturalist from their home or their location using a computer or device. Um, and it usually involves uh, using a lot of online tools and resources to complete the service. Our other type of project that we are presenting today through today and yesterday are distanced service projects. Distance service projects typically take place at a site or location. 
Um, they can be done solitarily or, or in small groups with the tightest of social distancing guidelines being followed. Um, and one thing to keep in measure, keep in mind is that depending on the location and the requirements of the, your, the local community that that takes place at or with the partner, there may be some additional health and safety restrictions that um, need to be followed at that time as well. Distant service projects can be place based or non place based. And we will, you'll be seeing some of those examples today. Um, another thing to note about the service projects being presented is that many of the projects are seeking the specialized training um, and eco region specific training of master naturalists. So, um, a project that happens in one part of the state is likely best served by the chapters that have received the training in that eco region. And so we have identified those chapters that will best serve that um, specific need or project need. Um, go ahead, move on. Well, thank you, Michelle and Mary Pearl, okay. for that intro. We will probably hear a little bit more um, maybe at the at the next break, um, which will be um, at the end of the hour here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started with introducing our first speaker. Let me make sure I am un unmuted. Yes, okay. Um, our first speaker is fr uh, Fran Hutchins. He is with Bat Conservation International, and his topic will be on Bracken Cave Preserve video projects. So, Fran, if you will go ahead and start sharing your screen, I'll let you know when I see it. Do you see it yet? Not quite yet. There should be a bottom that says uh, share screen. Yeah, I thought I pushed it. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry about that, guys. Oh, no worries. Uh, no worries. The um, WebEx thing goes away when I share my screen. So let me. Um, at the top of your uh, screen, there are some. Um, you can see file, edit, share. You might click. Oh, it's coming up. Does that work? It's starting to. I haven't. I don't quite see. Okay, we've got it. Go ahead and just put in PowerPoint the sc uh, screen mode, the full screen yeah. mode, and you'll be ready to go whenever you're ready. There we go. All right. Can you see it? Um, I see your desktop right now. You were there, and then. Yeah, some re for some reason that it's weekend, wigging out on my multiple monitors. Frank, um, you may need to um, make sure that you are sharing the right screen. So you may want to stop yeah, and then reshare the correct screen. Okay, let me. I'll start over. Sorry, guys. It's okay. I hear birds in the background. Sounds nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Share screen two. Okay, it's coming up, it looks like. And you're back on. And um if you can just um we're seeing your slides on the left hand side, so if you just go down to the bottom there and uh, that's it. it. Um Oh, it went away again. Yeah, so it's having a problem when I go to sh when I start the. All right, well then go ahead and just leave it in that. Yeah, we'll leave mode. it in this mode and rock and roll here. All right, guys, thanks for uh, helping out this morning, and oh, we'll get. Plan? Yeah. Oh, we don't see anything. Technology is wonderful. Okay, it's, it's coming back up. Technology is only a great thing if okay. you're under 40. You're ready to go. You're ready to go. <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right. So, our project today is for Bracken K Preserve and uh, video projects. Um, I'm Fran Hutchins. I'm the executive director of Bracken K Preserve. 
And just a little B, uh, Bat Conservation International, BCI, we're uh, basically a bunch of crazy bat people that um, love bats and our mission is to uh, the worldwide survival of this extraordinary mammal. And um, we do that through uh, research, scalable solutions, um, protection and restoration of landscapes, uh, a lot of endangered species interventions throughout the world and uh, inspiring experiences like our bat walks and our tours at Bracken Cave. The uh, Bracken Cave Preserve is a 1,500 acre preserve here in San Antonio. It's the uh, home to the largest colony of bats in the world. And it's a maternity colony for these Mexican free tail bats. So our project, video project is, we need uh, volunteers to do two things. One, we need to collect non-bat video of the preserve. We've got lots of inf video of the bats and the bat flight and all that type of information, but we don't have very much video of the rest of the wildlife on the preserve. So we need help collecting, um, basically filming landscapes of the other flora and fauna on the, on the preserve, and then editing that video. So it's kind of a two-part thing. Uh, editing that video uh, material down uh, to where it's usable. Um, basically, what we're hoping to get at the after we get this is multiple short videos of the deer, birds, other plants on the property, uh, some of the landscapes and the vistas that we have. Um, all of this is so that we can share it on our social media platforms, on our website. Um, use it for educational materials with uh, some of the virtual um, tours that we have on the preserve uh, with and uh, those type of things. Um, logistically, the um, need about eight individuals. We're not really uh, uh, to handle this project. Um, we'll be they'll be working on different projects at the same time. Um, it's a self-paced uh, project started in March. Uh, we're hoping to do most of the video collecting. If uh, So it's, we've got 1,500 acres, so there's no problem social distancing. Um, but uh, collecting the video uh, March through June timeframe when it's green in this part of Texas um, and the flowers are blooming and the landscape looks really nice. And, uh, and that wildlife is out before it gets too hot. Everybody goes and hides to get out of the heat. Um, and then the second half of that would be editing this, this video and creating these story video stories uh, with that information. Um, so if you're uh, collecting the video, again, that would be coming out to the preserve. And basically, it's like becoming a National Geographic uh, wildlife videographer and then um, otherwise you'll be working um, off your phone or your home computer doing the, the editing of the material. Um, again, we want to collect the video and stuff before uh, summer and then we'd like to get this project done uh, by September um, so that we can be and as soon as the project individual projects are done, we'll start using them but we'd like to wrap things up uh, by September of uh, this year. The um, kind of what your uh, basic equipment needs are, of course, you're gonna need the internet, email and stuff so we can communicate. The newer model iPhones and, and dro uh, Androids, um, you've, there's video uh, capturing, editing features built into those. Uh, of course, uh, if you're home computer, uh, you'll need video and audio ca uh, editing capabilities with those. Um, the individuals if uh, really would need to have some experience uh, creating these their little mini videos that they've done on personal projects or whatnot, or maybe some in a previous uh, job before you retired, that type of thing. Um, so there's no real advanced training needed. Um, we have examples of stuff that we've already created. Uh, to show uh, and to share, so they're kind of can be used as reference material and uh, to uh, for everybody to use. Um, the um, 
benefits to y'all it would be uh it basically this is this brings out the creative person itself and you can uh, those of you that are able to tell stories with uh, film and whatnot this is your opportunity to do that here's my contact information um, and I'm in the field a lot so the best way to get a hold of me is through email and um, so we're probably out of time for questions but definitely can email me with questions for sure thank you so much Fran I appreciate that um, I don't see any uh, questions in the chat as of yet, but uh, you will be presenting again uh, here after the second hour. So um, if there are any questions, we can definitely address those with Fran at that time. So again, thank you, Fran. Um, okay. I'm going to go ahead and introduce our next speaker, which is Tony Hennahan. He is with Texas Parks and Wildlife. He's an urban biologist down in the valley, and he'll be talking about uh, City Nature Challenge 2021 in the Rio Grande Valley. So I believe he is... Uh, He's yep, we're getting set up now, Judith. How you doing? Doing well. Thank you for that. So you should see my screen now. I do. And then do you see the presentation screen? Yes, sir, I do. You're All ready. right. So we'll get going here. Um, there we go. All right, good morning, everybody. So uh, this project is in the uh, Rio Grande Valley and it's dealing with the upcoming city nature challenge through iNaturalist. And so we're looking for folks to help out with the 10 day challenge uh, this spring. And it's a city nature challenge. It's a kind of a global competition among cities worldwide to see who can document the most species of plants and animals in their cities and surrounding areas. It's not, there are not all just cities. Uh, some, some of the areas are more of regional areas. And kind of like ours, we're looking for volunteers to uh, adopt a place here in the Rio Grande Valley. And that means Cameron, Hidalgo, Star, and Willacy counties. And the good thing about this is these areas can be as small as your backyard to a local park that you really like to go to. And we're just asking you to sign up with our local coordinators and say, this is the area that I'd like to cover for the City Nature Challenge. During the challenge, we are looking for you to document as much plant and animal life as you can with either the iNaturalist app on your phone, or you can take pictures with the camera and then upload them through the computer on, a, on the website um, during the event as well. And then if you are knowledgeable and comfortable identifying anything, plants or animals, we would ask that you help assist with identifications through the uh, City Nature Challenge as well. Um, now that's, part is more for folks who know what they're doing or are comfortable doing so. Um, we're really looking for, for folks to help document stuff. So INAT data uh, is regularly used by folks like myself with Parks and Wildlife, by nonprofits and academic institutions. Uh, this data is used pretty heavily to help inform management strategies, our research needs, uh, just baseline biological information. Um, I know I've sat in on uh, state ranking. So this is where we look at species that are kind of in need and we determine are they threatened or endangered. Uh, and we've used iNaturalist data to inform those ranking decisions. So this is really important information and we, we need as much as we can get. We're also looking to build citizen science involvement in our communities. This is really a great year to do this because a lot of us are stuck at home and we're, we're you know, kind of looking for stuff to do. And you can use your backyard as a place to learn about the, the natural world around you. So how many volunteers are needed? Uh, well, we need as many as we can get. Honestly, the more people we get, the better coverage we have, and the better coverage means we get better data, which leads down the road to better science. Now, activity is gonna be limited to this 10-day event. Uh, it starts on April 30th, and until May 3rd, that's when you take pictures and upload them. That's the window for that. And then between May 4th and May 9th, that's when we go in and log and go just try to identify as many pictures as we can of stuff. So if you are willing and able, we would look for you to get out in the field, get out in your backyard and just document as much as you can between April 30th and May 3rd. And then between May 4th and May 9th, again, jump on, maybe you like birds and you know birds. So jump on and look through the bird photos and see if you can identify any of them that need identifying. Again, this is in uh, the four county area, Cameron, Hidalgo, Willacy, and Star. 
And the hours are extremely flexible. It's what you're able to do and you're willing to do. We have some folks that go out on their lunch hour and they just take some photos. And then other folks take some time off. They're real dedicated, real driven, and they just they're out there from sunrise to sunset and even beyond. So the hours are extremely flexible and based off what you can do. The only equipment you really need is your smartphone or a camera and a computer and, and access to the Internet. Now, if you are unfamiliar with iNaturalist, we can provide that training to prepare you for the City Nature Challenge. Uh, you just need to let the folks know when you sign up that you're not familiar with it, you need some training, and then you'll be, you'll be kind of off to the races. I also encourage folks after you do the training, just practice. Go out, take some pictures, start practicing, uploading them, how to identify them, that kind of stuff. That way you're you're ready and, and you know raring to go. Now, what are the benefits? Um, this really is essential to understanding wildlife and plants of the Rio Grande Valley. There's a lot of stuff we still don't know about a lot of these, these things down here. If you look through some of the logs for some of the in insects, um, we have species that were found 40, 50 years ago here in the valley, and they haven't been seen since. And probably not because they're extinct, it's just because we're not looking for them anymore. We've switched priorities. So getting out and, and just documenting stuff is really helpful. Um, we had someone a couple of years ago start taking pictures of hummingbirds as they were in their yard, and they uploaded them. They had one they didn't know. And lo and behold, it was a Mexican violet ear hummingbird. It's one we get maybe once every couple of years here in the valley. It's a very rare hummingbird for the US. So they got a document, a really rare species, which is awesome. Socially, this is a really great um, opportunity to spend time with the kids and grandkids that are kind of, you know, running around full energy, looking for something to do. Uh, it gets them outside, it gets you outside, and you can just say, hey, what do you what do you want to see? What do we want to look at? And they can just start pointing things out and you can take photos and the app helps you learn about the world around you. So you can kind of keep them asking, you know, what is that? What is that? What is that? And you can help them learn and get them involved. It's a really great way for that. Uh, it also tracks the, the app can track who documents the most species and who takes the most observations. So give some folks some bragging rights and uh, kind of helps get you in that competitive mood. Uh, and you can also begin to develop an expertise. You may find that you just you're really taking a lot of pictures of dragonflies and you're just wondering what they are, what they are, and the app will help you learn more and more about them as they become identified. So you can begin to become an ex expert in really whatever you want to be an expert in. And so I'm here on behalf of a couple folks. Uh, I know Robert Gaitan, um, the president of the uh, Rio Grande Valley chapter, is uh, in the chat. Um, and so reach out to, if you're a part of one of these chapters, reach out to your appropriate person to let them know you're interested. And if you if you are planning on doing it, reach out to them anyways and let them know you're interested. Uh, and then we have John Brush as our Rio Grande Valley coordinator overall. He's coordinating with Tira and Elizabeth as well. But again, reach out to them if you're interested in participating or if you already knew you were and you just want to let them know where you'll be. So that's all I've got. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, I just wanted to also let everybody know that um, I, I don't want to steal your thunder, but <laughs> um, iNaturalist, um, the City Nature Challenge is uh, a statewide uh, uh, event. So um, your local chapter may be involved already. So I would encourage everybody to check with their local chapters to see if they're participating in some way with uh, some of the urban areas uh, throughout the state um, and the local urban biologists in that, in that city. Um, I, the only question I had was one that may be more relevant for Michelle to answer or Mary Pearl. It says, iNaturalist verification validation can be, oh, I just lost it. I just went to scroll down. Um, can be done by any Texas Master Naturalist member. Can the larger uh, Texas Master Naturalist community still participate to verify observations? Uh, the answer should be for the most part, but yes, I would think, but I guess the real question is, is if so, is this still considered place-based? Um, in some cases, for instance, you know, there are certain species that are statewide and they could be easily identified um, and because they're also from your area. But Michelle, can you address that possibly real quickly? Yeah, um, our, our Texas Nature Trackers projects and, and especially the City Nature Challenge, um, we always we always need master naturalists helping to verify, um, helping to ID the plants, animals, species um, that are reported through the City Nature Challenge and through our some of our other iNaturalist um, Texas Nature Checker projects. So, 
Um, we have had previous projects presented on that in the past. Um, and I think, I think we recorded those, um, but yeah, um, our master naturalist can help with verifying and IDing on this, on the city nature challenge, which was, is related to what this presentation just talked about, um, all across the state. Um, there was another question, Tony, about whether uh, potted plants can be included. Yeah, so I uh, answered that there. Um, the focus is, it needs to be on wild plants and animals. Um, so going to the zoo and just taking pictures of, of the animals in the cages, uh, they do need to be wild uh, animals and wild plants. Essentially native. Uh, well, they could be non-native species. Right, right, right. right. But, yeah. uh, yes, growing out in, in natural areas. Backyard, but not intentionally planted when it comes to plants. Okay, um, I think that is it. So I'm gonna go ahead and thank you so much, Tony. I appreciate that. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our next speaker. Um, it is going to be Brittany Chester and she is with TAMU's AgriLife Extension Service. And her talk is going to be on Aqua Plant website review. So um, let's see, I see her on. So hi, Brittany. Hi, um, let me share my screen. All right, you see that okay? okay. Yes, ma'am, I see you, so you're good to go. Awesome, and Mary Pearl, if you can make Lisa a panelist as yes, well. Have. Now. Thank you. Um, so my name is Brittany I'm Chester. on. Great, um, my name is Brittany Chesser. I am um, the Aquatic Vegetation Management Specialist with AgriLife Extension. Um, and one of the websites I run is the aqua plant website. And so I kind of presented this project at the last virtual volunteer fair. Um, and basically a little bit uh, about aqua plant is it's designed to help landowners and property managers identify and responsibly manage uh, their plants. So most of the time they're looking at both native and non-native invasive plants that are a detriment when they're pond. But we're really having more and more response um, with landowners and other entities that are using aqua plant to look up beneficial plants, look up um, propagation methods for these beneficial plants and um, some more um, benefits listed. And so right now we have about 216 aquatic plants listed. Um, it is a TAMU top 10 website. And these are just the stats from last year. So we do get um, 711,000 um, page views. Um, this is just, again, the average of last year. We have about 205 countries or territories that um, come on this website. And it's, so, it's, it's kind of a, a, a beast. Um, it takes a lot to continuously update it and manage it. And so just from the response that we got um, last fall, um, we got a huge response and then uh, we kind of uh, whittled it down to uh, two volunteers. A lot of people um, had dropped off and most likely just talking with the volunteers, it's because it is a very research heavy project. Um, you do need to be able to research these plants and then turn around and uh, make what you learned understandable to the common landowner. Um, but so far, just with our two volunteers, um, Lisa and Lieta, we've established a very good organizational system in Google Drive, I'll show you in a second. Um, based off of their recommendations, we actually did something that wasn't part of this project, but we increased search engine optimization. Um, and so far we have about 79 page evaluations that, um, are completed and so uh, we, we've covered a lot of ground in uh, the past four months. And so for the aqua plant review, what I expect from volunteers is that you're helping verifying, updating and expanding where possible, uh, making any suggestions that would be beneficial to the aqua plant website. And so primarily you'll see with a lot of our plants we're missing uh, maybe some fundamental key characteristics for our plant parts. So um, leaves, flowers, stems, fruits, and seeds. Um, it's habitat. I would like to be a little bit more specific than just a 
Um, these can be found around uh, static ponds. I would like to be a little bit more specific. Does it like more alkaline waters, you know? Um, and so we've been doing that. Um, how does it reproduce? Again, just a little bit more specific than what we have now, because people are trying to be more specific and intentional um, with their management, um, whether that be controlling or planting, and just maybe some interesting facts that might be beneficial to add on there. And then, of course, finding and acquiring photos um, when necessary. And so we have four different uh, aquatic plant categories, and one of them, our submerged plants are actually completely done, um, which is, if you ask Lisa, that's probably the hardest uh, category to do. There's not a lot of information out there on them, um, so it's probably the most, uh, I wouldn't say boring, but it's definitely you got to do a deep dive. And so just a quick overall of the process, um, we already have the folder set up in Google Drive, and then next to our recommendations from um, Lisa and Lieta about maybe um, we would increase volunteers if we had um, some of the templates already prepped. Uh, we do have an evaluations template uh, folder where Lisa has prepped most of these. And so all you would have to do for our volunteers is they go in, they pick a plant, and then um, Lisa has actually already made grammar, spelling, um, and link errors. So really you're only expanding on um, maybe what would be the most fun to you, um, the plant parts, the habitat, the reproduction, other facts. Um, so this isn't really, uh, hopefully this limits the amount of, um, you know, the monotonous feeling you get uh, if you were just going through and correcting very small grammar errors or something like that. So this is more um, maybe tailoring to a creative, uh, your creative side. And so just our project expectations and our outcomes, um, the final product will be a reviewer suggestion sheet like you saw in the last uh, in the last slide that's produced for each web page on Google Drive. And then these sheets, ultimately I use these to make changes on the website. And you'll just see some examples of how we've kind of increased, um, again, our cultivation and our pros and cons and just made them a little bit more specific. Um, so this is something Lieta did uh, for Aquaplant. And uh, again, it's just making this a little bit more specific um, to guide uh, people a little bit better. And so logistics, we need to finish about 180 plants. Um, so we're hoping for up to 10 volunteers max. Uh, it'll take about one to one and a half hours to train in Google Docs um, just on how to revise documents um, to be really, really straightforward. Uh, all work will be done remotely. And uh, this is something that we kind of sat down with Lisa, Lieta, and I, and we would like volunteers to commit to about 10 weeks doing about um, two plants a week at roughly two hours per plant. That's just what we've seen, um, again, for 10 weeks. And so maybe a total of 40 hours for the whole project. Um, we would like to be finished in two to three months, but the timing is definitely flexible. And so in terms of equipment and expertise, you definitely need a computer, internet access, um, just access to Google Drive. Again, I will assist you with um, setting everything up and then able to meet virtually. Um, and I use MS Teams for the most part for this project. And so, again, we would have a virtual training to go over the Google Drive. Uh, my perspective, um, this is a project that will help you freshen up or establish uh, some of your aquatic plant ID. Um, skills, you can stay up to date on scientific names, and you can get experience in delivering uh, more of an extension based education and web design. Um, and again, I already mentioned why this is really needed to get a little bit more specific. Um, but in terms of TMN, I feel like this really fits in nicely because you can get reliable information um, out to the public. And so, Lisa, I know we have a couple of minutes if you wanted to say anything. Um, I hope that uh, I come through clearly. I'm in a rural area and sometimes it breaks up, but um, this is very flexible in your hours. You can use your plant skills that you learn during training. I've already accumulated 95 hours. Um, one of the things is we plotted out how long it took to do 40 hours because the model number was unable to. This way you could get the 
this done and over with and get your 40 hours if you look at it the way we had it drawn out and um you know sort of if you have to coast the rest of the year if things don't improve you'll be set so and i always like to have a project i can work from home that way i don't have to worry about those days that are bad weather or if i i just can't get out for some reason and i will say Brittany was very accessible she explained how to use Google Docs to me, which I wasn't familiar with, and uh, several other things. So she's been very helpful. She's always been available. And the, uh, one thing I didn't add to this is this is um, something that you can learn that helps you with your group. Uh, they've got Aqua Plants now in, on the online, and you can use that database. Great, thank you, Lisa. Yep. This is my contact information. And um, I will stay around and just look in the chat if there's any questions. Awesome, thank you so much, Brittany. Um, we appreciate that. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our next speaker. I did not see any uh, questions in the chat though, but uh, definitely if you have any questions, please uh, go ahead and include those. Um, our next speaker is going to be Angela England and She's going to be speaking on invasive species surveys and verification, and she is with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. And Angela, I see you. If you'll go ahead and unmute yourself so I can hear you if you have any issues. Thank you. Let's see here. Let's see if I can start the. Okay, I see you. Everything. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, I can hear you. And, um, Great. At the bottom of your screen, there should be a share button, I believe, or you can go to the top and click share. So I see something popping up. It's not quite up here. Okay, we're ready to go whenever you're ready. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to be talking about invasive species surveys and verification. Um, so you should probably already know a lot about invasive species, but um, we like to emphasize that they are always in regard to uh, a, par a particular organism and whether it is native to that particular area. Um, everything's native to somewhere. Um, and so if it's native to Louisiana, it may not be native to Texas. Um, so it's one part is whether it's native or not to the area, but then also whether it causes economic or environmental harm or harm to human health or uh, animal plant health. Uh, if you want to get really excited about what the, the invasives are in your Texas eco region, you can go to the link here and it's later on in the film also in the presentation also um, from the Texas Invasives website and that's by your own eco region. So that will get you started on what's exciting to watch for in your area. The trick when a non-native plant or animal or organism is introduced to an area is that it's usually in really small quantities. There's just a few individuals that are introduced. Um, they don't always get established, but if they do and the habitat is just right for them, they can start to take off. If we catch them when they are in that lower part of the population growth curve, then we can head them off at a much less expensive, less time consuming manner than if we wait until they're really widespread. And so we always wanna do early detection. Um, also, we know that life cycle events vary in time and space. If you're trying to manage say a, a plant that is going to put out seed and make a whole new set of plants with that seed if you can catch it before it goes to seed then you're set but what we know from maybe if it was native to china is it still does it still have that same reproductive period in texas or wherever we end up and so we need to know what happens where and when um, so we need lots of eyes in the field and good reporting uh, statewide and year round. Let's 
sorry, transitioning here. So we need observers to report the sightings um, because there's so, only so many professionals and we can't be everywhere. And so citizen science observations, you guys in the field can get to places we can't um, and uh, we just don't have time to. Then experts can review and verify the data and then resource managers can take action if feasible. Um, sometimes it's so bad that we just have to go, wow. But a lot of times we can do something about it. So for invasive surveys, what we're hoping for you uh, to, to jump in on is to do the distance service with um, visiting parks, nature preserves, green belts, um, roadways, waterways, beaches, etc. Take your photos of invasive species and upload them. Now, there's two different ways that you can do that reporting for invasives. The texasinvasives.org website um, also does have an Invaders of Texas app, and that's available Android and iPhone. The Sentinel Pest Network report it is the 22 highest priority species. They, you know, on there, they're showing the emerald ash borer. There's a couple of others that um, we want everybody statewide to be looking for. Um, but there are many other species on the, the site. And so if you wanna look through all the species or um, just go to the website and look up their eco region for yourself, then that works too. Um, if you only wanna do insects, then you can go by category and just get into that section. Um, when it, uh, it, and it does have species accounts that you can search. So, um, the reports that we need for texasinvasives.org uh, or the Invaders of Texas app are the disturbance type. Um, was it a flood or was it a bulldoze and so forth? Abundance, is it rare? Is it widespread? Is it a little point like one critter, one patch? Uh, is it a big patch? Is it a fence line? And any notes um, that you may have that can help us understand what, what's going on there. The other way to do reporting is through iNaturalist. It is fast and easy. And what I like about iNaturalist is you can take multiple photos and um, uh, upload them. And that can help get different angles of key traits. So if you're looking at the top of a typical daisy or aster or whatever, Sometimes you don't see some of the stuff that on the side of that you can that really are needed to help identify that plant. And so um, you can do different photos at different angles. You can get the whole critter zoomed all the way out, the whole plant, the whole infestation, and maybe. Um, and then you can zoom in to get the ID um, details. The nice part I like about our uh, iNaturalist is it's so easy to learn because the artificial intelligence um, that is built into their system will suggest identifications. And so you can look at, here's a dandelion in my yard. So it says, we're pretty sure it's a dandelion. And you can say, well, it might be any one of those. And then you can use the, the comparison sections to go ahead and kind of go, well, does it look like this or does it look like this? And you can learn a little bit more about the, the lookalikes um, and then you can make your decision. If you're not sure, you can always go back and just say, well, okay, we'll get it to the genus and, and see if anybody wants to go from there. Um, you can also add your observations to projects uh, like All Texas Nature, that's a good one. Um, we also need uh, verification, and that's the virtual part of the service um, to uh, review other folks' observations. There's only so many experts out there, um, and so we definitely rely on you guys um, who maybe you know everything there is to know about cockroaches. Great, awesome. Um, I happen to know a lot about um, reeds, a giant reed, a rundo, um, and so I've gone through and identified a bunch of them. And now when I log on, it says, hey, somebody has an identification from um, that family. And uh, then they've got an, uh, a tentative ID. Do you agree or not? And so you can go in and help verify what's going on. 
what benefits come out of this? Um, here's an example of one uh, with two different species of elephant ear. These are just as likely to be, if you take, if you see it, you're gonna take a picture of it, just as likely to take one as the other. And we know that by looking at iNaturalist, we've got 760 observations of one, 57 of the other. So we know that this is more of a problem for this species than it is on this. But if we wanna do control efforts, we know where to start looking. Um, we can get great voucher photos. Um, this helps improve the artificial intelligence ID. And uh, you get, we get more trained spotters. So we can use as many people as possible. You can do it anytime you want. There are some upcoming bio blitzes that you can uh, get in on. There's a National Invasive Species Awareness Week that's coming up at the end of this month. City Nature Challenge, definitely throw in some invasives while you're out looking for the cool native stuff. Um, the Texas Invasive Species BioBlitz is mid-May. Um, remember, you can do this just about anywhere and verifications can be done from your home. Uh, you can do single visits or throughout the year, but we definitely want uh, different stages of reproduction and growth and, and living and dying, all of it. Let's see. Angela, um, you come do need if um, we're uh, coming to close here. So um, if you can okay. uh, wrap it up. Okay, uh, so you need the apps. This will be uh, saved somewhere you can get to them later. Do you want to look those up? And uh, you'll need to go through the um, criteria that are available from your local group on how to get your what types of observations count. And it's so much fun. You can track your stats, and get your life lists. Thank you very much. Hope to see you, you all online. Put your, go ahead and put your contact information on the screen if you have that as well. Yeah. Um, I did not let's see. Um, it's the only question that is up against a break, so yes. um, we do oh. have like a little bit of time if you wanted to cover something. Um, there are a couple questions in the, the chat as well. So uh, there is one question, uh, Angela. Do you prefer observations on public land, or does it matter? If you are doing them for your um, volunteer hours, um, then it needs to not be from your own property. Um, as far as public lands, it's part of the nat master naturalist um, criteria that we are trying to help um, the underfunded public land managers to get uh, more knowledge about what they're doing um, and, and what needs done. And so right of ways and stuff like that. I love doing right away surveys. We've got to be careful not to get hit by cars and stuff like that and always be safe. Um, but, you know, we want to know where invasives are everywhere. And if you happen to be out on a friend's property and see an invasive, maybe it's one we didn't know was there. Maybe it's one of the sentinel ones that we're really worried about. Definitely. I want to know everything. Um, and so, um, do what you need to do. I think it all contributes to knowledge. So. Anything else? Um, is there a project in iNational attached to this effort specifically? Or do they just... Uh, we do have... Is there a project? Not uh, set up by itself. There is a bio, the BioBlitz I do have a project for set up. Um, actually, I haven't set up the 2021 yet. But um, there are a couple of them that, that are on iNaturalist. I didn't uh, tag any of them specifically. Um, I'm not affiliated with any of them specifically, so. And I apologize, I don't have the catalog up and running in front of me, but is this a statewide project or is this? Uh, yes. Like, okay. All right, but that was all the questions that I can see. Is there anything else that you Great. wanted to uh, finalize? Last comment of any kind? That was important that- No, I hope to see you online. Okay, thank you so much, Angela. We appreciate your time today. You're welcome, thank you. Uh-huh.
And um, with that, we are on break. I thought uh, maybe Michelle or Mary Pearl was going to um, continue talking about some of the things regarding the, the program, but um, feel free to get some coffee or some tea and um, we'll see you back here at, on the hour at, all, at 10 o'clock. So, uh, yes, we are on break till 11. So, we've got six minutes, and um, I can fill the space with uh, some noise. Um, going back to cover some of the um, presentation that we didn't get to, the housekeeping things that we didn't get to cover earlier this morning because we were tight on time. Um, <clears throat> before we broke to uh, have our first speaker, our first presenter on the first project of the morning, I had been discussing our virtual service projects in distance service projects um, and then next how to report your service when working on these projects once you get signed up um, and there is just a little bit of a delay so all right um, once you find a project from the list that is being presented here over the past few days um, you can sign up and remember that the survey monkey link that we've been dropping into the um, chat box is where you would sign up to kind of put your name on the list to be involved with that project or be contacted about working on that project. Um, I, we do want to warn everybody that we saw from our last virtual volunteer service fair that uh, in places where a um, smaller amount of volunteers were needed, like eight to 10. We had um, so many more members sign up for those projects. So there, there are sometimes uh, limited availability. And um, the project coordinator will contact you to um, kind of gain inform more information about the skills you would be coming to, coming to the pro project with. So how do you log your volunteer service hours on projects once you have uh, signed up and you're, you've started volunteering? Um, there's kind of uh, two different ways to do that. One is um, we have our place-based service projects. Those will be, um, you'll report to those just a little bit differently than how you would report to a virtual service project. So the place-based service projects, you're gonna log your hours. Many of the place-based service projects, as we mentioned, happen in a specific location um, within uh, a specific ecoregion and are best served by uh, chapters that are trained in that ecoregion or serve that area. And so a place-based service project is likely um, already a place or project opportunity that's set up in your, your chapter's area if your chapter works in the specific region. Um, they are things like a state park or natural area or even a nature center. Um, so what, if for the place-based projects, you would report your service that you work on that project to that, that project opportunity in your chapter's drop-down list. Um, <clears throat> if you don't see the project opportunity in your drop-down list, you'll need to work with your chapter VMS admins um, to see if that project is appropriate for your region and, and um, your, your chapter's local service area. And then secondly, how to re how to report your uh, virtual service projects. So that will be reported just a little bit differently. Um, for all the truly virtual service projects that are presented through our virtual volunteer service fair, you're going to report them back to this project opportunity, TMN virtual volunteer service fair. So if you're working on a volunteer virtual volunteer project and attending today, you're going to report back to the same project opportunity. Um, throughout uh, your time on that virtual project. Uh, for the, when you do report for the virtual service project, the service performed, you're going to enter the title of the virtual service project um, when you work on your logbook entry. So you'll, in your logbook entry, you'll report the title of the project you worked on and then what you did. And then um, lastly, just following up on what, what these two types of um, project opportunities look like. So for the place-based service project opportunities, um, as a member, this is what it might look like in your drop-down box um, when you go to report. 
And uh, this example happens to come from the Heart of Texas chapter in that general area. Um, the place-based project was stream team testing at Fort Parker State Park. So that, that uh, location, that park was al already an opportunity um, that that a place that that chapter works on. So you would report um, to Fort Parker State Park the re, um, field research projects in um, using this example. And that's for the place based service projects. For the virtual service projects, it'll look a little bit differently. And that's what you see on the right hand side of the screen. Um, you would report your virtual service uh, back to the, vir the uh, TMN vol virtual volunteer service fair um, report hours. And so you, uh, that's where you would report the title of the virtual service project that you're working on and then what you did. And then I think, I think that covers everything. Perfect timing. <laughs> and, and as we're wrapping this up and, and I'm passing the presenter rights to the next speaker, um, please know that these slides that you see in front of you um, are on the website and I'll drop that link into the uh, chat now as well. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our next speaker. Uh, it is going to be Joshua Lee with Texas Parks and Wildlife and um, uh, the topic is going to be Adopt a Loop, Great Texas Wildlife Trails. And I see Joshua. Hello. Right here. Hi, good morning. Let me share my screen. Okay. Okay. All right. You are up. Oh, All right. Yeah. Great. Well, hello, everyone, and thanks for joining me today. My name is Joshua Lee, and I'm a marketing specialist with the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department for Nature Tourism. And as part of my role, I'm the coordinator for the Great Texas Wildlife Trails. So today I'll be introducing you to a new project we just recently started for the wildlife trails called Adopt a Loop. Uh, this project is actually based on a similar one which started in 2016 by the Virginia Birding and Wildlife Trails and Department of Wildlife Resources. So first, I'd uh, just like to give you some quick background on the Great Texas Wildlife Trails for those of you that may not be familiar with the trails. Uh, this year is actually the 25th anniversary of the first coastal birding trail which was completed in 1996. Uh, this was the first trail of its kind in the US and a few years later, the rest of the coastal birding trails were completed in 2000. Uh, other trails across the state have been added over the years with the far west Texas trails being the most recent addition in 2010. Uh, the most recent printed map updates were done in 2016 and the coastal birding maps are actually currently being updated for a special 25th anniversary release in the spring of this year. So the, the trail system is comprised of nine trails in five regions across the state. And you can see here, the map of Texas shows the nine different trail systems. And then along the bottom is the unique signage for each of the five regions. There are currently over 920 individual viewing sites along the trails. Uh, these sites are organized into 124 trail loops, which are clusters of viewing sites that were originally designed to be explored over two to three days driving site to site. Uh, there's a multitude of different types of sites, uh, highway pullouts, nature centers, scenic overlooks, local, state and federal parks, bed breakfast, and many other types. Uh, these sites are all marked along the roadway with the appropriate wildlife trail signage. And we have interactive maps on, and the printed trail maps are available for sale by either individual region or in a full nine map set. So what is the adopt a loop project? Uh, we're inviting master naturalist chapters across the entire state to adopt loops of the wildlife trails that fall within or near the chapter's local area. There are several ways for volunteers to assist with the project. Uh, we're finding a lot more opportunities can be done remotely, um, computer or phone, and that includes just annually verifying that contact and site information listed in our database and on the, the Wildlife Trails website is accurate, uh, conducting internet, email, and or phone research, um, ensuring TPWD is providing quality information to the public for wildlife viewing and nature tourism opportunities. And another part of the project includes actual in-person site visits. Uh, these are 
in-person visits to, to all the sites along the adopted loops. Uh, part of this is to make sure that our signs are still posted, uh, viewing the sites in person to ensure that the site itself is even still usable and viable for the trails and to record and report any other details that, that you may observe while you're at the site. There's also a big citizen science element to the project. Um, we're asking to do seasonal surveys using iNaturalist and eBird to observe wildlife at the adopted sites. Uh, this will help TPWD better understand the distribution of Texas's wildlife along the trails. And we've also created an adopt a loop iNaturalist project where participants will submit those observations. Um, this information will be used not only in the trail updates, but to help inform visitors and tourists on what species to look for when they're at a particular site. So as part of the project, we're asking that the chapters, not just individual volunteers, agree to making a commitment to adopting a loop or loops, and then we'll elect one person as the, the project coordinator for that chapter. So this person will be the main point of contact with myself and TPWD, and we'll then recruit participating volunteers to select individual sites along that chapter's loop. So the ultimate goal here is all these activities are going to help us increase public awareness, appreciation, and conservation of Texas's wildlife and native habitats and allow us to create kind of a cohesive marketing tool to promote wildlife viewing and citizen science in Texas. So some of the logistics of the project, obviously with 124 loops and over 920 sites across the state, there's plenty of opportunity for volunteers to contribute to the project. Uh, our plan is for site visits, the in-person site visits to be conducted four times per year on a seasonal basis. So wildlife can be observed at different times of the year. Uh, there is some flexibility on this, depending on the number of loops and or sites that the chapter adopts. So chapters adopting multiple loops have the ability to rotate loops throughout the seasons. And I can provide more information on that if, if a chapter decides that they want to adopt multiple loops. Um, the time commitment for volunteers really depends on how many loops or sites are adopted. And the length of time for site visits will also vary greatly just depending on the site. So some of the smaller sites might only take 20 to 30 minutes, while a larger site like a state park that has miles and miles of hiking trails may take several hours. Um, this will be at the discretion of the chapter's coordinator and the, the volunteers. And for the larger sites, you know, if multiple volunteers want to go out and visit a huge state park, that's obviously doable as well. And our, our goal with the project is for it to grow statewide and, and continue for years to come. It is a, a long-term project. So each chapter will be provided with maps showing all the sites within the chapter boundaries. So here, for example, is a list and a map of all the sites within the Lower Trinity Basin chapter. You can see they've got 15 sites along two different loops, and these maps are, are provided in addition to the interactive maps that are on our website. Our GIS department actually developed these specifically for this project. And then this is another map that, that they developed uh, providing just the loop. So this is an individual map showing the Balconis loop. And as you can see here, this chapter or this map, this loop, sorry, <laughs> runs through four different chapters. And a lot of the loops on the trails do extend through multiple chapters. So in this situation, chapters are encouraged to share the loop by just adopting the individual sites within their boundary. And then it would be the job of the chapter coordinator to communicate that with the neighboring chapters to ensure that sites aren't inadvertently being reviewed by multiple chapters. And we can provide the contacts for the, the chapters that are already part of the project. So as far as experience and equipment, um, the volunteers are going to be provided with most of the materials they need for a site visit. That includes the, the site visit checklist. Uh, we have a printed window sign to put in your car stating that you're on Parks and Wildlife and Master Naturalist business. Uh, we also recommend printing or access on your smartphone for your uh, site's information on the Great Texas Wildlife Trails website so it can be verified with the site manager. And then some additional things would be, you know, digital camera or smartphone to make the wildlife observations, uh, binoculars, any field guides, and possibly a notepad. Uh, volunteers can join the iNaturalist project once they have an active profile, which I'm guessing most of you do. Volunteers are also provided instructions on submitting observations to the Adopt-A-Loop iNaturalist project. 
And for anyone unfamiliar with iNaturalists, we, we do offer some additional training on that at your request. So the project benefits, the biggest benefit for you guys is the ability to earn volunteer hours while visiting some of the best wildlife viewing sites in the state. Uh, this project will also help to get more people involved in citizen science and conservation. Our ultimate goal is to make wildlife viewing more accessible for everyone in Texas and you helping us to have accurate up to date information for the trails will will definitely boost our efforts to share the information with the public. And as I said, your observations will help us track wildlife across the state and most importantly, the species of greatest conservation need. So here's my contact information um, and the link to the wildlife trails website if you guys haven't had an opportunity to see that. And it looks like I've got about one minute left in case if we have time for any questions. Let's see, I don't uh, let's see how does a site oh, go ahead. one question come in directly? Um, and as a reminder, please use the chat selection all panelists so that we make sure that everybody uh, has a chance to see that question and can answer it quickly. Um, but Anne asked, do you want three observations per day, morning, noon, and evening, if the chapter has sufficient members to do this? That would be great. Yeah, if, if, if you want to burp in the morning and visit in the afternoon as well, yeah, that's that's really, you know, at, at the discretion of that chapter and how many hours they want to allocate to the project. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, there are a few questions on the side. I don't know, Joshua, if, are you able to answer those in the chat? If not, um, I can ask that they submit them directly to you at your to your email. Uh, yeah, if you could just email me, that'd be great. Okay, very good. All right. Um, all right. Well, thank you again, Joshua, for sharing this exciting project. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I'm going to introduce our next speaker who was here this morning, um, Fran Hutchins with Bat Conservation International. And um, he's going to be presenting his project on the Fat Bat Project. I can't wait to hear about that. Good morning, Fran, I see you. Welcome Good morning, in. everybody. And I see your presentation, so whenever you're ready. Good. There it goes. I thought I lost it for a sec there. Okay. Uh, yeah, our project here at Bat Conservation International National is fat, our fat. We call it our Fat Bat Project. Project. Um, little shortly, a little brief uh, explanation of who we are. Um, we're a nonprofit bat conservation organization. Um, a lot of expert conservationists and scientists, and we're ensuring the worldwide survival of this very extraordinary ant mammals, uh, bats all over the world. Um, our preserve here in San Antonio, Racken Cape Preserve, is a 1,500-acre preserve near San Antonio. It's the home to the largest colony of bats in the world. Uh, it's a maternity colony for these me migratory Mexican free-tailed bats. The um, there we go. So, so our we call it Fat Bat Project, our artificial prey patch uh, research project is um, the technical name for it. But what we're basically doing is because of white nose syndrome and its effects on our hibernating bat species, we're, um, and, and what the short version of it, the fungus is affecting our hibernating bats and they're starving to death. So our uh, idea is to put a few extra grams of fat on these bats before they go into hibernation. Or here in Texas, we do have opportunities because of our warm weather, as most of you know, it's going to be in the 80s today. Um, so the bats do have an opportunity to come out and forage for food in uh, during the winter here in Texas. So um, if we uh, what we're researching is the ability or, or the opportunity to have a concentration of insects near these cave roosts for these bats to forage on and add some uh, extra body weight really quickly before they go into hibernation or throughout uh, the winter. Um, the data we're collecting um, is, are, is in little four-week cycles throughout the se uh, different seasons, um, and it's uh, part of the data as we're sorting insects that are being collected in these bug traps, and we're also reviewing acoustic data that's uh, being collected at these sites so we know uh, what species of bats are using them. We're trying to figure out two things. 
uh, one, what, whether fluorescent lights or the LED lights that we have, strip lights that we have available, which ones are attracting more insects or does it, it doesn't matter. LED lights are cheaper, they uh, are easier to uh, use, and also they're, uh, they use less power, so they're easier, easier on batteries. So if we, and then we also want to know what species of bats will be attracted to these uh, prey patches and take advantage of them. So I need about six volunteers. That's plus or minus. Depends on uh, how much uh, data we have to deal with. Um, basically, you're going to be sorting data. Um, so if you like to geek down on data, this is your this is your volunteer project. Um, it can it can be done at home. It's a this is a non-travel type of virtual thing. Um, the uh, basically um, you're going to be sorting uh, insects um, just down by order, um, and we expect the project to be completed uh, in March of 2022. Um, so there'll be periods of time where there won't be anything to do while we're collecting the data. And then we've got to analyze it and sort the insects and that type of thing. You're going to need a internet connection, computer, and uh, basically the minimal vol uh, information about insects. We just basically are sorting down to it's a moth, moths and butterflies, beetles, flies, that type of thing. We're not trying to uh, figure out exactly which species of moth are in that, that much detail. Um, so, so, and we will we will train people on how to work how to uh, use the acoustic um, software that sorts uh, the bats calls and teach teach you how to use that. That's not a problem. Um, let's see. Uh, the biggest benefits is um, if uh, if this research project is successful and um, we're able to. Uh, uh, figure out that it works. This is something that we can take to scale all over the U.S. at these high vernaculums um, and uh, and just basically help save thousands and thousands of bats from starving to death. Um, my information, the easiest way to get hold of me is through my email address because I'm in the field a lot. Um, so uh, that's email contact information. And uh, do we have time for questions? We do have time for questions. You have about uh, three, a little less than three minutes. Um, okay. I don't see any, um, although they did seem, someone commented that they thought this was a really neat project. Um, I don't see any other questions though, per se, at this point. Okay. Um, so, um, Fran, if you would. Um, the next uh, one. Uh, well, actually, we're gonna, oh, oh, go ahead. Sorry, I just had a question pop in. Um, how many hours per week are you looking for a volunteer? And then um, can you put your contact information back up? Yeah, I mean, it's um, uh, it, it, when we're, for example, it, it could, it might just be a few hours a week. Like if you're, if you're one of the ones that's sort of the sex, it could just be a couple hours once you, because basically I'll mail you a bunch of drugs, a bunch of dried bugs, and I just got to sort them. Um, and weigh them and that's it and so and then you'll mail them back to me and uh so you know we'll handle all the postage and, and all that but um so it'll be uh just just a few hours of uh, acoustic calls a uh, little your time it just depends on um the, the more you do the better you get at it you're just uh, the, you're running a basically bat calls through this software and it sorts them out and then you just catalog them so it's uh it would be a few hours a week um but then there's be periods of time there won't be anything to do there is another collecting the data there's another question fran uh it uh -huh. says sw southwest run on mac pc question mark i'm not sure what yes. that's for okay Yes. So the, the uh, yeah the the acoustic equipment uh, software programs that we have will run either on Mac or PC, so it's not a problem. Okay. And another one is: Do we have the option to do one of those two tasks, or do we do both the acoustics and the bug counts? 
No, you, right. yeah, we'd be separating it out. So somebody, yeah, you, so it, one would be, maybe somebody's into the acoustics and that's what they would be working on or somebody's just into sorting the bugs. So yeah, you don't have to do both. Okay. All right. Um, we're not quite at 1020 yet, uh, Fran. So if you'll just hold on a few seconds. Sure. Because some people are coming in at certain times. They have the agenda. So we're yeah, no worries. early and we're trying to stay on time as much as possible. For those of you all listening, uh, Michelle did indicate that Master Naturalists that uh, may be uh, may only be a member of one chapter. Chapters are encouraged to work together on projects in their shared areas versus um, not sharing their members. Because I think there was a question about if you could be a member of one chapter and, and help another chapter. Okay, is the bat population decreasing in your project area? Question mark. And that will be the last question before you start, Fran. Uh, what was the question? Is the bat population decreasing in your project area? Not well. Yeah. I, well, yes. I mean, we have the disease in the Texas Hill Country, and and we are uh, having fatalities because of it, uh, but it's not widespread uh, over Texas just yet. But in other parts of the United States, we've had die-offs up to up to ninety percent of uh, of a colony of bats has been wiped out by this disease. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and um, introduce you again. Uh, Fran Hutchins is on, and he is with Bat Conservation International. And his next project, his third one for today, um, is going to be about story time for bats. So go ahead and get started whenever you're ready. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for, for joining us today. Uh, this project is Story Time for Bats. I'm Fran Hutchins, the director of uh, Bracken Cave Preserve. Uh, just a short um for those of you that don't know anything about Bat Conservation International or BCI, we're a nonprofit conservation organization that's focused on the worldwide survival of uh, bats. And uh, through research and scalable solutions to save them, uh, protecting uh, and restoring landscapes uh, that the uh, bats are foraging in and living in, and, uh, and, spe and spe uh, endangered species interventions into some areas where we've got threatened endangered species. Uh, Bracken Cave Preserve is our 1,500 acre preserve here in San Antonio. It's uh, home to the largest colony of bats in the world, uh, which is a maternity colony of migrating Mexican free-tailed bats. So uh, hopefully you guys will come visit. The, um, so our project, uh, is called Story Time for Bats, and basically, we're having people videotape them reading uh, children's books about bats or caves um, in different languages, uh, so that we can share these languages, these these readings, um, on our website and other social media platforms uh, all over the world. Uh, so the volunteers will be creating a video of themselves reading. Uh, various children's books that will supply um, in, in non-English languages. So let's see. So basically um, our expectation is to have um, a number of quality videos. There's, there's dozens and dozens of really good children's books about bats. Some most of us heard of Stella Luna, for example, um, that um, so we want to, uh, to get as many of these books in as many different languages as that we can get them in uh, to be able to share uh, with, uh, with uh, people all over the world. So logistics, um, there's not really a limit on volunteers other than just the limit on how many different languages that I can get um, and other than we won't do 12 Spanish videos of the same book, but we'll do multiple different books. Um, so this is a self-paced um, project. So we would uh, sign up for a book um, and uh, we want to start in March. And as soon as these are done, they'll be, uh, hopefully we'd get everything done by September. Um, but once these, once each video is done, it'll be loaded onto our website and shared. Um, but it's like it, it's done with each individual's phone or computer, just depending on what they're savvy with for, for making these videos. Um, it could take a couple hours to 
put one of these videos together when you're first getting started. Um, but once you uh, once you figure it out, it goes pretty quick. Let's see, <clears throat> so you need the internet, um, one of the newer model iPhones or Androids, or a home computer that has these video audio capabilities. Um, there's no advanced training uh, needed other than we'll uh, we'll show you how to do this. We've got some little uh, little YouTube tutorials. Um, so there, it would take about a half an hour, 45 minutes to show you how to make one of these and the formats that we want them to maybe be made in. And we also have examples of ones we've already done uh, for people to use as reference. Let's see. And the biggest benefit is um, we get to share, you get to share these, these amazing books that we have available. Um, to people in, in their native language and, 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 and basically sharing your ability to, to do that in that native language. Uh, so, and it also creates a positive impression of, about bats and uh, to a lot of people that maybe don't have access to books in, in the area that they're in or in the native language that they speak. So here's my uh, contact information. Uh, the easiest way to get a hold of me is through email and questions. Thank you, Fran. Um, I did not see any. There was a comment about someone wishing they could speak uh, Spanish better. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I will admit I do speak fluent German, but I don't know if there's a need for that. I could even. Yes, there is. Uh, uh, we, we don't discriminate against languages. <laughs> so uh, we. German is is one that uh, one on our list. So yeah, so okay. just let us know what language it is that you speak, um, and we'll sign you up. Okay, that sounds great. I, I think and I'm even in Spanish, is, there's different dialects for different okay. countries. So uh, sometimes there's a little little idiosyncrasies between different countries. So okay, well, don't, there is don't a hesitate. Okay, there is a question on um, how will we get the books? The books. Um, We'll we'll uh, we'll mail them to you. So if you if uh, yeah, so we'll get you the books. Um, I I did come in, Fran. Um, somebody was asking about um, have you addressed the copyright restrictions for books to uh, to make sure that yeah. So we have we have the information for the format that we're doing these in that addresses the copyright Excellent. issues. And are the books written in the different languages? already no these books we have a few are but most are written in english so yes first yeah, so we're kind of audio yes yeah, the audio translation of the books the audios are available or are you saying uh, the person needs to um, do the audio translation yeah they're going to basically yeah we're going to have we have an english bush, book in english and then we're going to read it in whatever german or whatever language that person but it's the volunteer would need to translate it essentially. Correct. Okay. Okay. I don't. Uh, I don't see any other questions. Um, so unless you have anything else that you wanted to mention, um, we've still got about two and a half minutes. No, I'm good. So unless there's no other questions, you might want to put your um, contact information up for just another few seconds, yeah. and um, we'll wait until uh, ten thirty for our next speaker. any other questions um oh uh do you have a specific list of books or could we use one of our own kid bat books uh, we do have a list of books but if somebody else somebody has a, a, a book that they're familiar with we'd be more than happy to use it um so yeah so we can always it may be one of the ones we have on our list Okay, I do have a question myself. Um, if you um, have a book, um, how is it visually? Is it visually included in the audio translation or is it only an audio translation? It's a, it's a video audio translation. Okay. But the, the problem is the, I guess what there's, the, 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 the visual part will be in English. Right. The, the, essentially they'll get to see the book. The picture you'll see the book place. and the pages and you'll basically be reading them the, the in, book, in, in, in whatever language okay very good <clears throat> i don't see any other questions um 
All right. Well, um, thank you again, Fran. Mm -hmm. um, if you would um, go ahead and stop sharing and I'll get the next speaker up. All right. Thank you very much. And Meg, are you, I see Meg. Um, if you'll unmute yourself, Meg. Yes, okay. hello. Hello, go ahead and start sharing your screen and I'll introduce you. Meg Inglis is with the Native Plant Society of Texas and she's gonna be doing a presentation on her project um, titled Plant ID Bingo. And it looks like it's coming up. Yes. Okay, okay. and I see it. Let me do the slideshow. Ah. Let's see where it shares it. Um, why? I can see. There you go. You're up and running. Okay. Whenever you're ready. All right. Hello. My name is Meg Inglis, and I work for the Native Plant Society of Texas. I'm the Native Landscape Certification uh, Coordinator uh, for, for, this, for NIPSAD. And just to give you a little bit of background information about the Native Landscape Certification Program, and I'll call it NLCP from now on if that's all right, because these acronyms drive me crazy. But uh, it's a series of day-long native plant landscaping classes, and uh, they're, it's on, uh, it's, they're hosted by the Native Plant Society of Texas all over the state. And hold on, I got to get myself out of the way here. No, I can't do it. Hold on. There we go. It's a series. Uh, so anyway, it's a series of day long classes. And here is an outline of the different classes. Level one is introduction to native landscapes. Two is landscape design. You'll learn how to do a, an actual landscape design. Uh, level three, it, once you get that design done, you need to understand how to install it and maintain it. Because as we all know, native plants are a little bit different than the traditional or conventional way of maintain, maintenance. And then uh, level four is stewardship of native plant communities, which we will be bringing to you in the fall of 2021. We also have a companion class called Native Landscapes for Birds. It's very popular. Um, these classes are hosted by chapters throughout the state of Texas. So I work with them and they give the class. And basically they talk about the area in which they are located. And so they will be talking every in levels one through three in the companion class at, at any rate, they talk about 45 native plants and uh, five plants that you, we want you to put into your landscape and then five plants that we, we hope that you don't put into the landscape. So that's a little bit of a background on the program itself. Some of you may have taken the class uh, the master naturalists have approved, many chapters have approved advanced training hours. And I know that master naturalists and uh, Texas master gardeners are frequent uh, registrants of the, of the program. So, and by the way, I'm a Hayes County, I, I took the Hayes County master naturalist program way, way back when. Okay. Now, why isn't it advancing? Okay. So, Plant ID Bingo is a fun activity that the uh, VP of Education at NIPSOT created using something called a bingo generator uh, for us to play at our NLCP classes. And the goal is to increase the student's native plant ID skills so that if they choose to take the test at the end of the class, they will be able to answer the plant related um, questions. And also because they want to go out into the field and look at plants, et cetera, and, and learn about them. And what we need are some volunteers to create the game pieces using the bingo generation software. So here are the pieces. Um, on the left, you'll see a bingo card. These are, never fails. Uh, these are cards that uh, the students will receive and we can do this virtually or we can do it in person depending on whether the classes are are online or in person um, and they'll each get a bingo card and then the the player image sheet in the middle is sort of a cheat sheet which the players can use to help themselves identify what the caller is calling out the color reference sheet and you'll see the color reference sheet over on the right 
And so the caller will, would uh, name the plant and then identify some characteristic and the person would have to figure out which, if they had that plant on their bingo card. I'm sure everybody's played bingo before in their lives at least once. Um, we, need our, we need several volunteers and basically it's a, uh, you work on your own schedule, uh, you would be working on your own computers, and um, as far and I need to create, well, I'd like to create about 30 sets of bingo, but I do have a priority. I would like to get my level ones done first. So if I'm unable to find enough volunteers to do all 30 sets, then um, we'll, we'll start with the, the level one classes. And just so you know that if you are in a particular area of Texas and you only want to work on your bingo game, that's fine with me. I'm okay with that. Uh, it's going to take, I won't lie, uh, several hours to complete one bingo game set. And what I'd like to do is have as many games available to the NIPSOT chapters by July 31st for their fall classes. So you'd need a computer and the internet. Um, you'd need to have access and the ability, access to and the ability to use Zoom, because that's how I would train you. I would I'd like to get together with uh, the volunteers later in February and spend a couple of Zoom, Zoom meetings uh, training you on how to use the bingo generator. And then um, it requires an understanding of how uh, Google Sheets. If you're not familiar with Google Sheets, that's OK. Listen, we're all learning new software programs. That's actually one of the benefits of this, pro of this uh, project is that you'll learn new uh, computer software programs. And then hopefully you have some level of uh, understanding about PowerPoint because we're providing you all the information and a lot of the photographs are coming from PowerPoints. Um, let me see. And I will certainly provide you all the support you need. I would never, uh, so I'll be there to help you all the way through. What are the benefits for you? Well, number one, we all want to make sure that we get the message across about the role that native plants play uh, for the ecosystems. And so you would be doing us a service and educating the public about that. Um, then, as I said earlier, if you want to learn about your own plants in your own area, you would learn, you'd, be, you'd have an opportunity to really learn those plants. <laughs> and uh, so I think that's a great thing. And then if you are really enthusiastic about this, you could learn about plants all over the state of Texas, which is what I've learned doing this job, because now I know about Houston plants. I'm from the Austin area. And so it's, it's very, very interesting. And then the other thing that I think is really neat is that you could take this bingo, uh, uh, applica the application, the platform, and use it for other topics. Like if you wanted your master naturalist chapter to have some, uh, play bingo on birds or amphibians or pollinators, et cetera. Uh, and that, that is, a, I think, a really important uh, opportunity for you. And then finally, um, I, you would learn how to use new software. And we're all learning how to new, use new software as time goes on. We had a real ramp up last fall to do all of our classes, our NLCP classes online. And I have to say that it really does keep you on your toes and, and uh, up to date with everything that's going on. Um, so anyway, my name again is Meg Inglis and I'm the NLCP coordinator. And here is my information, meg.inglis at nipsot.org, number 512-589-1316. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. We do, have, we do have a few. We have a little under two minutes to answer some questions. Um, uh, the first one is, is the ID information for the plants already available or do we need to come up with that information ourselves? The ID information is readily available. It's all taken from our classes. So you'll really get a familiarity with the plants. We have all, we have the plant list, we have the characteristics, we have the photographs, we have everything you need to do it. So you would only be taking the information and putting it on this uh, bingo generation uh, uh, software. Okay. And then um, are the different sets by level, I'm assuming class level, are they by region? Yes, we have um, levels one through, uh, I'm not quite, 
Sure. So we have all these different levels, and some of the some of the regions of Texas have all actually do all the classes, and some regions only do one and birds, and some regions do uh, just birds. So it it just depends on the region. Is there a specific region they had in mind? Um, they did not indicate that. No. Okay. Um, so the San Antonio, for example, has all classes. Okay. Um, will volunteers be supplying their own photos, or are we going to use the ones provided by um, the Native Plant Society? The ones provided by the Native Plant Society. We have in the classes, we have a, a PowerPoint that we use to talk about the 45 native plants and the five invasive plants. And so the, um, the PowerPoint slides we would be downloading those PowerPoint slides into JPEGs and sticking them into the Google Sheet. And then we also have a, 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 plant, um, a plant list that has all the information about the characteristics, et cetera, that would be put into the um, bingo generator. Okay. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, there are a few extra uh, questions in the chat. Are you able to see those and answer those, Meg? If not, I can put your email in there and have them reach out to you directly. I will be happy to check the chat. Thank okay. you so much. Thank for you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Yes. Thank you for uh, joining us. All right. Our next speaker is going to be Louisa Torrance, and she will be speaking on aligning Texas Parks and Wildlife. Department Educational Resources with the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills, also known as TEKS. And I see your presentation is up, Louisa, so uh, feel free to start whenever you're ready. Uh, unmute yourself. <laughs> the famous line of the year. There we go. It's over on my share screen page. I was looking for it over here. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you and good morning. Um, I really appreciate this invitation to join the virtual fair. Um, my name is Louisa Torrance and I serve as the distance learning coordinator for state parks. And I'm also a proud master naturalist with the South Texas chapter. Um, my call to action today is to find a master naturalist uh, with wor experience working in education, either formally or informally to help us align agents see educational resources with the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills. So to provide a little bit of background on distance learning, um, TPW Discover is the agency-wide brand for free TEKS aligned content designed especially for early childhood to 12th grade learners. And this encompasses our interactive virtual programs that we deliver through Zoom as well as the lovely um, work that's done on Connected Texas. You may have seen some of the um, excellent Connected Texas programs produced by Coastal Fisheries. Um, it also includes our educational resources spreadsheet, and this is a brand new redesigned page on the agency website uh, specifically for um, education as well as our new education YouTube channel. So that is separate from the main channel. Um, it's focused on, again, delivering educational content. So new virtual TEKS line content is being created by staff across the state. Um, these are some examples of uh, Dinosaur Valley, um, out at Waco Tanks, um, a presentation on um, nocturnal animals by Katie Rainey out of Central Texas. Um, and so there's new content being created constantly with the idea of, hey, let's make sure that these have TEKS alignments so that they can be utilized in the classroom. However, there is an abundance of materials and activities that have been made over the years that would also be incredibly useful for educators. Um, so this Master Naturalist Volunteer Project would First of all, employ your eye for student learning standards. So being able to look at all of this previous content that's out there and say, oh, that reminds me of something that might be learned in a fourth grade science class, um, as well as being able to see the alignment or videos um, and also have the enthusiasm to actually watch and review the resources, um, since part of this project is watching videos and reading through um, activities to look for that alignment. 
So the first place to begin, um, if selected for this project, would be the Parks and Wildlife main YouTube channel. So there are hundreds of videos that could be useful to educators um, if they had a way to search through them for TEKS or a particular subject area that they may be interested in. Um, from last fall's virtual fair, we have an amazing team of Master Naturalist volunteers who are already making strides in TEKS alignment. Um, for instance, one has chosen to review and align the super fun whiteboard series that focuses on aquatic invasive species threatening Texas lakes. So in this video, which is called Alien Invaders, um, she discovered several science, math, art, and even social studies alignments. And so those can be categorized um, and, and used by educators. So after viewing YouTube videos on the Parks and Wildlife main YouTube channel and adding TEKS alignment, what happens next? Well, your work would get added to our internal education resources spreadsheet. And so this document is updated and will be uploaded um, to that website page I showed earlier that can then be downloaded by educators. And so this is a screenshot of what it would look like from your end when you enter TEKS next to individual videos. So I'll have either a playlist or specific video links that you'll be able to access. You'll watch them and then be able to align them uh, by entering them into the spreadsheet. I then take those entries and put them into our SharePoint file and that coordinates with the website. And so this is a screenshot of how the videos are sorted to be easily accessible by educators. Um, you can see we have resource type, um, subject area, topic, audience, grade range, a link to the video a description, of course the TEKS, and I had to cut off a few extra columns, but also even the location where it was filmed and contact information if they wanted to reach out directly to the um, person who created the video. So each month, that document I just showed you gets updated to the website and is available for download. And so that makes it a really great resource. Again, it's searchable. Um, teachers can come back and look and see what's been updated each month. So in terms of project logistics, um, I would love to work with as many master naturalists with educational experience who are interested. Um, this is an ongoing project. Again, updates are made throughout the year each month, but um, there's also a ton of great work that can be done during the summer. Um, it's a completely virtual project. Um, our communication will be through Zoom meetings and through email, but I'll also give you my phone number if you prefer that way. Um, because so many of the videos are short, one to two hours a week can accomplish quite a bit, um, especially if the videos you're reviewing are three to five minutes. Um, the total commitment would um, be to provide, you know, at least one video or resource alignment each month that we can add to that educational resources page. Uh, for project experience, equipment, and onboarding, I'm looking for volunteers who have experience and familiarity working with the TEKS at any grade level or subject area. Um, there's plenty of videos that relate to the humanities, fine arts, social studies, physical, physical education, um, and so it's not just science that we're looking for. If you have a background in other areas, that would be great. Um, in terms of equipment, Reliable internet and access to a computer, tablet, or phone is necessary to be able to access the videos. Um, when new volunteers join the family, we'll have an onboarding Zoom meeting and we'll get to know each other and review the whole process more in depth to make sure that everyone is comfortable, comfortable with project logistics. So hopefully the benefits for you shine through in this project. I mean, first is the direct contribution that you'll be having to help build a strong educational resource for educators. Um, this is a quote from a fourth grade science teacher who said an educational video from El Paso State Parks team was amazing. Not only did the link work, but this content was superb. The students are going to love it. This is really going to help students make a personal connection with this unit. Um, so like that's the power <laughs> of video and learning that we want to provide. This project also helps meet your own master naturalist goals of providing education outreach within your communities. Um, it's really awesome to be able to directly link uh, educators to valuable resources, especially when they're related to the area that you live in. 
Um, these are two screenshots from the education YouTube channel. One showcases Annie Hep and her raptor in the Waco area and Holly Grand along the Texas Gulf Coast. Lastly, you get to join a lovely group of fellow educators and volunteers and become part of our TPW Discover family. Um, as we work together, this initial project can turn into much more. Um, for instance, we've already had a complete TEKS update to the Junior Ranger booklet, and we have a volunteer working on TEKS updates to the Keep Texas Wild magazine that came out about a decade ago and just needs some updating. Um, I'm more than happy to provide advanced training as well in online learning platforms like Zoom and and you know, could help you with your own distance learning program that could be added to the TPW Discover collection if you'd like to make one. So with that, my project um, contact information is there, Louisa Torrance at tpwd.texas.gov. Um, you're also welcome to follow us on social media. So we've got Facebook, um, Instagram, as well as our YouTube channel. So I know that's right at the end, so <laughs> I'd love to hear any questions that came in. Yes, ma'am. Um, do you want them categorized by grades? Yes, grade level, um, basically just the standard TEKS nomenclature where you have the, the subject area, the grade, the TEKS, and the standard. Okay, and then um, does a volunteer have to be able to know TEKS across subject area, or is each resource reviewed by multiple volunteers with different specialties? The latter, yeah. So definitely stay within the the area that you're comfortable with and then if we have someone who can supplement in a different area they can also review it as well great question okay those were the only two that i saw all right all right well thank you so much louisa for joining us today yes thank you so much some help <laughs> all right so um now we are uh, scheduled for a break so you have 10 minutes um, and then we will resume again on the top of the hour at 11 o'clock
Hi, Jamie Ray. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm good. How are you, ma'am? Good. Thanks for letting me be part of this. I'm excited. Absolutely. We're a little early out of break, but I'm going to go ahead and share the presenter rights with you so that we can get started right at 11. Okay. And then Judith's going to um, provide the introduction for you. Okay. Okay, there's my chair. So, I, uh, okay. I'm going to try and watch the phone on my time, the time on my phone. Um, I'm in full screen, so I can't see the clock. Okay, Judith will give you a little bit of a signal when it, you're getting close to time. Yeah, to. I, I heard that on the previous one. She was very politely strong about um, She's amazing. Yep. Yeah. And she'll introduce you here in just a second. As okay, well. great. Thanks. Good morning, Jamie. Good morning, Judith. How are you? Hi. Um, so I, we just have a few seconds, but, um, I guess I can, oh, uh, the time just hit. Okay. So, uh, Jamie Walker is with us this morning, uh, with the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service, and her talk is going to be on Texas Municipal Park Providers Inventory. And so whenever you're ready, Jamie, go ahead and get started. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Jamie Ray Walker. I am the Urban and Municipal Park Specialist for Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. Um, and I help, I support our urban and our municipal park programs. Those are your local parks, so not your state or your federal, but they provide typically your parks with trails and swing sets and playgrounds. We provide planning and policy support um, for them and a considerable amount of continuing education. Um, and about um, almost nine years ago, we conducted a inventory of um, how many parks um, or municipal parks are out there in our Texas communities. Um, what their budgets are, how many employees they have, and what type of educational needs they have. Um, and it is time for us to update it. We were going to do it last year, but COVID um, kind of slowed us down. And so we are looking for volunteers um, that can help us um, collect this information from our communities. And some of, collecting some of it's very easy. We can actually do that through a quick email. Um, but first of all, we always have to contact, um, confirm our local contact. Um, the park directors, Often there's a little bit of turnover and in our smaller communities, it changes sometimes who's in charge because they always don't have a park department. So there's not always a clear contact. So one of the uh, first barriers we run into is finding out who we're supposed to be talking to. And then it's really simple sending a survey request um, and we can't force or coerce anyone to participate, but it does take a couple of follow up sometimes to remind people that if they would share this data, it'd be very helpful. Um, we also sometimes, particularly with the smaller, medium-sized park departments, need to help them troubleshoot some of their answers. And I'm gonna, in a later slide, I'll explain this, but we'll have a little training available. But And we ask them what types of parks they have, and we have a typology, and not everyone follows the same typology. So we sometimes have to help troubleshoot. Um, and then sometimes it's really fun if you really like talking to people and learning about what they're doing in their communities because sometimes we have to adapt um, and we can't just send them a survey. We actually have to um, schedule an interview with them and really talk them through, talk with them to get the information. Um, and that, if you like talking to land managers and people involved, um, it can actually be pretty fun. Um, the project outcomes overall, what we end up with is a database and a very nice report um, letting everyone throughout the state and outside the state know um, I have a pretty good picture. It's not completely comprehensive, but a pretty good picture of what exists, how many municipal parks, how many municipal trails, lengths, sizes, and sometimes types of more specific amenities. Um, and this is great, particularly when we're helping communities make decisions so they can see what their neighbors have, what they don't have. We had a real fun instance where a smaller community down in the border um, was able to get some grant funding for trail and they had questions about what type of surfaces would work in their region. And so we were able to look in the database, see other similar communities with similar sizes um, and see uh, and, and call them and find out what was working for them. Um, it's also, um, and so it's a really great outcome overall for the state. And I just saw a question, this is not for privately owned parks, this is for municipally government owned parks. Um, um, so the project outcomes for a volunteer, your outcomes would be helping generate a contact list, um, 
generating strong communication with our straight statewide municipal providers and um, hopefully some completed surveys on the fun end, hopefully some very interesting interviews. And this is all online um, and over the phone um, right for right now. Um, and it will stay that way probably for this year. Um, but if you're a person who really likes check marks and likes to have lists and you can check mark and say, I got that step done um, or I'm working on this step. Um, and you just need to feel like with COVID-19 that you're getting something finished. This is a type of project for you because there are several phases and steps throughout and several opportunities to go into a um, spreadsheet and just hit click. Yes, done. Um, logistics, we can take about 10 to 20 volunteers. If there are a lot of people interested, we can work with the um, Texas Master Naturalist leadership team to see if we could take on more. We would like to roll this from March 1st through May 21st. Um, majority of the work is virtually. And um, when you're, if you're just looking at your stuff or looking things up online, you can do it anytime you want. But if you're needing to contact the land managers, that usually has to happen Monday through Friday during business hours. Um, but the time commitment is flexible. You can give as much time or as little time as you want to to the project. Um, sometimes you'll be put on hold because you'll be waiting to hear back from someone. And so you might work on another set of communities. Um, so it's not always fluid, but it is always flexible. Um, we are gonna ask everyone to attend an online training, um, but we will offer that three times in early March. And we'll use a doodle poll with everyone who signs up to figure out when and how we can reach the most volunteers. We'll also record it and um, again, it's not an incredibly formal training. We just want to make sure everyone's on the same page, but we can record it and then touch base with you to make sure you don't have any questions and you're clear on the expectations. And then we will have virtual office hours on an online calendar where if you have questions or you need support, you always know when and how you can find us. Um, most of the work again, actually all of the work will be on the computer and virtually and on the phone. I mean, you need some basics, inter uh, basic computer skills and you would need internet um, access. Um, if you think you have the computer skills, but you're like, well, I really don't know how to work with a spreadsheet online, but you're willing to learn, we are willing to teach you um, some basics as well. Again, this is a great project for someone who likes lists and check marks and talking to others who likes logistics. It's also a great project for someone who understands that collecting this type of information can have really bigger impacts for our community. I've already talked about some of the examples of how it helps our municipal landowners be able to see who has what and connect with each other when they have specific questions. It helps us from extension understand what um, educational needs are out there, who has what. Um, we've also worked with the Texas um, Recreation and Park Society with the previous data and they were able to use it to guide policy um, on the state level for funding for municipal parks when we were um, when we were looking at making sure all the sporting good tax or more of it got to Texas Parks and Wildlife because some of that does trickle down to your municipal parks. Um, it also, again, it helps um, when they're making federal decisions and they call us and ask us how, you know, how many municipal parks, who are they serving, who doesn't have them. It actually can help change and support the grant landscape on a federal and private level as well. Um, so there are bigger impacts, um, bigger impacts and it looks like you're just doing some check marks and making some phone calls, but the, uh, the database is invaluable for policy funding and then local decision making. Um, so um, again, we would have, we'll have a training in March if anyone's interested. And I am fine if, um, if the project leaders for Texas Master, Nat Master Naturals are okay with this. I'm okay if you sign up and then you do the training and you say, this isn't, this isn't what I thought it was. Um, but again, we just need some people to help us find, confirm who the land managers are in each community. We have the community database. Um, reach out to them, encourage them to take the survey, and then kind of friendly push and end result interview them to get the, the data we need for the database. I missed a few of the questions. Is there somewhere I can go back and see the questions? Um, actually, I, I can tell you what the questions are, okay. Jamie. Um, so the first one was, um, what are the benefits to the municipal parks themselves? So. Um, what it helps us do is we actually share the data through the Texas Recreation and Park Society. We actually put out um, either a PowerPoint or a, a, a nice report showing everyone what each other has. Um, and then it, uh, it what has helped in the past is the local land managers have been able to find out who's doing something similar or who has similar size assets and create a network for them to talk to each other as they're moving forward. And um, that's actually been incredibly helpful for them to see, well, who has a budget like mine? Um, because not all park departments can accomplish and maintain the same things as their neighbors or other communities if they don't have similar staff and budget resources. 
So it kind of helps them find their cohorts, if that makes sense locally. Okay. Um, and then um, this does not include privately owned parks, correct? It does not. We right now, um, we actually have a hard time. Um, just We have over 400. It's actually probably closer to 500 now in, in Texas that have at least one municipal park or more. Some have over 70 municipal parks. So managing that is um, more than we can, is all we can chew right now. So we're not looking at private parks yet. Um, how many local cities would you prefer each volunteer handle? So that's going to depend on the number of volunteers we get. Um, we'll be contacting between 500 and 600. Um, and it, again, it would also be how much time you have um, and how quickly they're responding. So we'll use a rolling database where people can tag who they're working on um, and where they're at. And it will be in Google Docs, so um, you'll be able to see it. Um, and it will kind of be based on who has how much time and how many volunteers we have. Okay. Um, uh, as far as municipal parks, are we talking about city, county, and regional parks? Right now, we're talking about city, um, city and community. Um, if we if we get through the city one, the city and community, and I say community because um, not all of our communities are actually an official city. Um, um, but if we get through those, we will try and tackle county. We have a hard time with county because then you have to go down to the precinct level, and it's we have we've had a really hard time figuring out who knows who owns what. Okay. Unfortunately, we are out of time, um, Jamie. There are a few extra questions in the chat. If you are able to stay um, and answer those, that would be wonderful. Otherwise, I can put your email um, address in there and they can. I will happily stay and answer them in the chat. And um, awesome. if anyone has any questions, just let me know. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for sharing today. Sure. All right. Our next speaker that's up is going to be Brittany Chester. Uh, with uh, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service again. And um, her topic uh, will be aquatic plants uh, photo submission round two. Great, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm back one. Again, my name is Brittany Chesser. I'm the Aquatic Vegetation Management Program Specialist with AgriLife. And primarily um, a part of my job is to get um, resources such as photos to include them in our extension materials. And so, just a little bit about this project last year, I kind of opened it up on a whim um, just because I wasn't doing any site visits. I wasn't really able to get out and get on people's property and take pictures to kind of um, continue to um, develop a photo bank for uh, our extension materials. Um, and so when I opened it up last year, um, we got eight different chapters um, that submitted photos, um, about 11 volunteers, but we got over 391 photos. Um, so it was a lot to sort through and probably this project could have been a little bit um, even bigger and probably reached more chapters. Uh, that was just kind of on my part. Uh, I got a lot of uh, phone calls and emails and I wasn't able to answer them um, as quickly as I would have liked to um, for them to for different chapters to put this information in their newsletters. Um, and so as soon as I sent it out to Mary Pearl and she sent it out to the chapters, I got an immediate response. And so uh, with that being said, this year I'm looking for to open it up again, but I'm looking for someone who will kind of organize this aquatic plant submission process. And so compiling a list of highly needed species or certain features on these plants, sending out a call to the TMN chapters once submissions are open. Um, I learned from last year, they like to include this information in newsletters and other, um, other sources. Uh, someone to manage the Google form where the volunteers will submit their photos and then organizing them in the Google Drive and confirming identifications when possible. And then also what I like to do, um, what I did this past year is I sent out a submission summary to the volunteers because of course they, um, you know, I had people submit who wanted um, IDs. I had people submit who wanted to see, you know, how many total that they submitted. And so um, I, I would really like to continue that with the summaries. And so uh, this is something where this is the opportunity to kind of make it your own. Um, if you want to do a competition between chapters, um, I'm willing to, you know, do that or, um, you know, this is something where you can definitely develop it. Um, I definitely think that it can be approved from last year's submission progress. Um, and so the outcomes of this is to have a well-organized photo bank 
folder in Google Drive. So then these photos can be taken and they can be on Aqua Plant on um, our publications. And of course, um, one of the things that the reason why we need so much organization for this project is I like to cite or provide the photo credits um, for every master naturalist. And so this takes a lot of organization to make sure that these photos aren't being used um, without the photo credits. And so we've already had a couple of publications come out where um, the submissions have been um, used and the master naturalists have been listed um, under the photo credits and they really like that and I try to keep up with it and send uh, the completed publication to them. And so if you uh, submitted it in the past, I really appreciate it. Um, and that's kind of the end, the end goal for the project. And so in terms of logistics, I really only need one person, um, unless if you're a two person team that has just great communication and you're willing to work that out yourself. Um, of course, uh, I might get multiple people signing up for this. And so um, I would like to have a conversation with each person that signs up just to see kind of um, where their thoughts are at for this project. This can be completely done online. And initially, um, I think for the startup, you should expect about five to eight hours um, per week, just if you're um, talking to the chapters, um, talking to individuals that might have questions. Um, but then it's going to it's going to decrease and it's really going to be dependent on the submissions or the number of submissions you have every week. Um, but timing is very flexible. If you're someone who likes to work um, on the weekends or at night, um, this is something you can do. Um, during that time, of course, the initial contacts would probably need to be made um, at a reasonable time um, to the chapters. But uh, the project duration is submissions will stay open until the annual meeting. So that's just like last year. Um, last year, I don't think the submissions opened until August. And so I would like to open them up earlier this year, um, just because aquatic vegetation is going to start taking off. Um, pretty shortly once the temperatures warm up. In terms of experiment, experience, equipment, and advanced training, you need a computer, you need internet access. I would like that you already have some idea of Google Drive and how it works, but I'd be more, more than willing to um, help you out with that. You must be available to eat, uh, meet virtually on Microsoft Teams. And then it would be a huge plus if you're able to identify plants at least down to um, genus. And so um, typically for advanced training, I, I'm thinking roughly two hours just so we can go over expectations and kind of put down a game plan for any thoughts that you may bring to the project as well. And then just to go over and set up um, the Google Drive and the um, Google form where people will be submitting these photos. And so in terms of the benefits for you, uh, I, I know a lot of people really like to get back into um, you know, certain project management. If you're someone who's really organized and you kind of thrive off of this and uh, you really have some creative ideas, I, I think this would be perfect for you. Again, you can um, freshen up or establish some of your aquatic plant ID skills. This would be um, a really big test because of course, I will be um, I will be uh, double checking that, and then um, you know why is this needed? We teach through photos, and we cannot be in the field, which has been this whole year. Um, and even when uh, we are allowed to be in the field, primarily we're not out identifying photos because we might only find a couple of species. So photos are really the number one uh, resource that we use to help. Um, to help our educational programs. And so um, I, I think that is all. I saw some questions. This is my contact information. Yes, Brit, uh, Brittany, we have one question here. It says, so do you also need more aquatic photos? Yes, so that's the whole, uh, so this project, hopefully we can have someone who organizes this, sets up the form and sets up the submissions. So then we can make a call out um, to the, um, the whole master naturalist group. And that way uh, we can receive those photos and kind of have an organizational system to 
um, document them. But yes, we do need aquatic photos. Um, as you saw throughout this presentation, um, we have a, a lot of really great photos that we got last year, but we're still missing um, a lot as well. And then, um, it, uh, I guess a question slash comment, um, you only, uh, do you need an organizer? Yes, so that's what, um, for this project right now, I'm looking for an organizer for this um, aquatic plant submission project. So this is what I'm hoping to get out of um, this virtual volunteer fair. Okay. So it's a, so it's an organizer to prepare for more photo submissions later. Correct. Thank you for that clarification. Yes. So if that wasn't clear, um, that is exactly what I'm looking for. And that's why I would prefer if it was only, um, you know, one person. And then that way, if there's multiple people that sign up, I would love to have a conversation with each of you and determine um, who may be the best fit. Very good. Thank you so much, Brittany. We appreciate you spending your, your morning with us and offering us this great opportunity. Um, with that, um, we have about a minute left and um, before the next speaker, and our next speaker is going to be Tiana. So, if Tiana, if you're there, if you'll go ahead and uh, get your. Hi, Tiana. Tiana, we can't hear you, but we can see you. And you should have the option to present your screen now. No, ma'am, we still cannot hear you. No, ma'am, we still cannot hear you. Uh uh. Like one of those old commercials. Can you hear me now? I can see your lips <laughs> saying that, but I cannot hear you yet. For some reason, I'm not seeing any images. I'm not seeing anybody. I can't even see Tiana for some reason. Oh, there we go. Now I see. All right. So, Tiana. Uh, Raymond is going to, uh, she's with the Botanical Research Institute of Texas, and she's going to be presenting armchair botanist, community scientist transcribing specimen labels, or a shorter title, yeah, Did you you the plants of Texas. <laughs> and we still can't hear you. So she's going to try and change the audio. No, ma'am, we still can't hear you. You want to change your audio input? I think we can hear you. So try can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. There you are. Wonderful. All right. Sorry about that. Switching from presentation platforms sometimes confuses my audio. Um, thank you very much to everyone, uh, to the organizers. We appreciate you allowing us to, to talk today. Uh, thank you for sharing the catalog. I've already had some people email me about the project, so we're really excited. Um, and thank you for everyone who's already helping on this project, which has been going on um, about a year, almost a year, and to everyone who is in the audience today who's interested in hearing more about it. So hopefully you're now looking at a screen with a pressed and preserved herbarium specimen. Great. Montana, I can see your face, so if you nod at me, then I'll know. Um, so welcome to the Armchair Botanist uh, program. This project is the result of uh, 46 different herbaria that have come together to digitize their holdings of dried and preserved plant specimens that document plant existence in Texas and Oklahoma through herbarium specimens. So to continue with the theme that Brittany had, now this isn't looking at living uh, living um, plants, unfortunately, but it is looking at some really cool plants that uh, you will be familiar with and from all over the state. Uh, this is a project that was funded by the National Science Foundation, and you may hear me refer to the acronym TORCH, which is the Texas Oklahoma Regional Consortium of Herbaria. And so this project is all about the fact that we have an estimated 1.4 million preserved plant specimens across these 46 herbaria that currently reside in cabinets in our herbaria, and they need to be liberated. Those data need to be available for big research projects. 
And so what we are looking for assistance with is looking at images of these specimens and transcribing or typing out that label data into, um, into a database. So our expectations for this project, with volunteer effort and staff effort, we hope that we'll have 1.4 million specimens collected in Texas available to the public online, as well as an additional 0.6 from Oklahoma. The website that you can see there is where these data will be disseminated. This is where you can go to this website today and see what has already been digitized and run searches. Um, and then lastly, a local community will be developed um, that's aware of these herbaria, their importance and their contributions for ongoing research studies. Um, over here in the top right, you can actually see Dr. Joseph White working with uh, some master naturalists there in the Baylor University Herbarium. So here's the nitty gritty, here are the project logistics. We can, uh, for this project, we're actually utilizing sort of a third party platform. This is Notes from Nature. Those of you that have worked with Zooniverse projects before, community science uh, projects before online, uh, may be familiar with this already. That top image is from that uh, website. Actually, both those images are from that website. Um, and service for this project is really carried out totally at your own schedule. It takes about five minutes to generate a single transcription. So to type out the details from a label into a database or into a, a prompts, as you can see in the bottom right hand corner of this screen. Um, so it takes five minutes or you can contribute five hours. It is totally up to you. It can be anonymous or you can log in. We provide support in the form of weekly. We have open to the public Zoom sessions that you can join and attend. Last year, we were doing them on Thursdays at 2. Um, this year, we've moved to Wednesdays at noon to accommodate folks that may want to join us on their lunch hour while they're at work. Um, and it will be ongoing for multiple years um, because it will probably take us that long to, to get these data all put together. So what do you really need to participate? Well, you need access to a computer with Internet uh, capabilities. You need to be comfortable navigating web pages and searching online. Um, and the place that you'll actually be doing this service, notesfromnature.org, does have a built-in tutorial. Um, but we've created a one-hour YouTube video that you can um, listen to to give you a little bit more background about the how and the why of this um, and then the nitty-gritties of like how to actually do it. Um, and then again, I'll reiterate that every Wednesday at noon, we have um, an armchair botanist series that um, is typically uh, run by myself or Ashley Bordelon, who works in the herbarium with me at the Botanical Research Institute of Texas, um, and also some of our data managers. So if you're a data person, this is an opportunity to kind of talk data and data um, management, as well as plants. We do a lot of plant identifications and just share information amongst ourselves at these sessions. They're very informal. And then here are the benefits. So this, this is uh, going to give you a better understanding of the botanical and the herbarium processes. We go over this on a weekly basis in our Zoom sessions, and it does give you a historical perspective on our state. So we start with a, a resol high resolution image of these specimens, and they're shared online, but we don't know what we have. So you could come across something like this specimen that's up here. It'll be hard for most of you to read, but this was collected in El Paso County um, in the 1850s. So this was Charles Wright, one of our first Texas botanists collecting along the boundary survey uh, with Texas and Mexico. So pretty, pretty exciting stuff. Um, it will uh, expose you to or let you become more familiar with some of the botanical tools out there for understanding scientific names, um, looking up accepted names, synonymous names um, to hopefully expand yours and our botanical knowledge. And then lastly, something that this does is it, 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 uh, it leads to many tangential projects um, that will help us better document the Texas flora. We're dealing with these legacy collections that already existed, but they can inform our future collecting practices. So it's pretty important to get these records um, digitized. Now, this project is across 46 herbaria. Right now, because of COVID, a lot of herbaria had to close their doors and couldn't really get started on this. So you are seeing um so right now most of the data that are the images that are up there are from the botanical research institute of texas herbarium and the fort worth botanic garden um, and there's some additional benefits to um what my colleague who's also co-presenting with me uh, will talk about so montana may i pass it to you 
Yes, absolutely. Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. So, like Tiana said, you do not need to be a Brit or garden volunteer to participate with this project, um, but we suggest you do. Um, and if you become a Fort Worth Botanic Garden volunteer and a Brit volunteer, um, we can recognize you for your service because you'll be able to report the hours and time that you spend with this project. Um, but we're also, it helps us secure grant funding in the future because we have a better idea of how many volunteers really participate with um, transcribing these specimens, the Brit specimens specifically. Um, you also have the opportunity to earn a free membership after you provide us with 100 hours of service. Um, and then you can also, you know, uh, attend free educational presentations and workshops on our campus or virtually. And you have the opportunity to participate in fun projects like Stickworks, which I think uh, one of the volunteers on here said that she was coming this afternoon. So lots of opportunities there. We hope you decide to become a volunteer of our organization. Um, it's really simple to register. All you have to do is go to. Um, Tiana has it up here. It's Brit.org. Become a volunteer. Submit an application there. Um, we will send you an email letting you know that we have received your application and ask whether or not you're interested in being a virtual volunteer or you'd like to um, become a long-term, uh, long-serving volunteer on our campus. Um, you don't have to do any of these forms if you're just going to be a virtual volunteer. Simply sign up and you're ready to volunteer. Um, but if you do decide to, um, you want to come on our campus, at least when the threat of COVID has gone away, um, you do have that option and you'll go through this onboarding process. Um, and this is our contact information. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I, we have a, a one quick question, if you can answer it. Um, what about, uh, so is the primary overall activity we, we would be doing uh, is transcribing slash cataloging? Correct, Judith. Okay. All right. Well, we are unfortunately out of time. Thank you both so much for joining us today. And um, uh, hopefully we, um, there, if you'll check the chat, see if there's any other questions that pop up. If you could answer that, that would be wonderful. Okay. So our next speaker is going to be uh, Mason Lee with uh, the uh, Texas Horned Lizard Conservation Society. And the topic of the project is Horned Lizard Conservation Educational Materials. And Mason, let's see, you, I see it popping up. So uh, you are good to go whenever you want to get started. Unmute yourself, Mason. I still cannot hear you. There you go. It looks, go ahead and say something. Am I good? Yes, ma'am. Okay, okay, cool. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so my name is Mason. I'm with the Horn Lizard Conservation Society. And today I will be asking for um, your help in creating some educational materials for horn lizards. So the Horn Lizard Conservation Society, if you are not familiar with us, um, we're a small volunteer run nonprofit. We started in Austin in the early 90s, um, but since then we've expanded to be a multinational organization. Um, we're dedicated to protecting horn lizards throughout their range. So we uh, support work in Canada, Mexico, and across the Western US. A lot of people in Texas don't know that we have 17 species of horn lizards, um, let alone that we have three of them in, in Texas. Most people are just familiar with this lovely lady on the left here, our Texas horn lizard, which is our state reptile. Um, but in West Texas, we also have the greater short horn lizard here in the middle and the round tailed horn lizard here on the right. And a lot of people haven't seen these lizards in the wild before, um, especially a lot of young Texans haven't seen our state reptile in the wild uh, because of their big population declines that they've been experiencing for the past 30, 40 years. So we are in need of volunteers to help create educational materials uh, for kids, for adults, or aimed for the general public so that we can educate Texans and teach them that there's more in the state than just the Texas horn lizard and teach them more about each of the species and how to conserve them so that they love, protect them, um, and hopefully we can have them around for generations to come. So the materials that uh, are created could be used on our social media, on our website, uh, or in educational packets and at outreach events when it's safe again to hold those. 
So we have a lot of different things that can be created since education materials can come in many different forms. Um, so really this project can be suited for anyone who's passionate about education or passionate about horns or conservation. Um, we could use help creating educational social media posts. So if you enjoy social media, um, you can help us create some posts on there. Uh, we could use activities for kids, and that includes both informal activities, so things that can be done um, you know, at outreach events or at home with their families, uh, or formal lesson plans that follow Texas science standards. Um, if you're an artist, we could use help with creating some coloring pages or games or stories and um, things like that. So the possibilities are really vast since education can come in so many different forms. And we do ask that all educational materials use current research um, and that you list your sources um, for the research that you do use in creating your materials. And if you create coloring pages or stories or games, it must be your original work. So there's no limit on how many volunteers can help with this project. Uh, we're happy to work with anyone who has any educational ideas. Um, all of the project is done virtually and remotely, and it's very flexible on how much time you spend. Um, so if you just have an idea for like a few educational social media posts, it won't take up too much of your time. Um, if you want to create like a Texas science standard lesson plan, then it might take a little bit more of your time. Um, and we're also flexible on like how many materials you submit. You can submit as many as you want or as few as just one. Um, so that also kind of depends on how much time you spend on the project. If you're going to be creating more materials, it might take you a little bit more time. Um, and we don't have an end date for the project, I'd say maybe by the end of the year. Um, and we do ask that you submit materials as you finish them, because before we publish them or use them, um, our board does have to review them. And you really don't need any advanced training or special equipment. Um, you just need the ability to conduct background research on current horn lizard knowledge. So to do that, you might need internet access on a computer um, to look up articles or recent research. Um, or access to a library to look up maybe some more basic background information on horn lizards. Um, and I don't know if Texas Master Naturalists get access to journal articles um, through the organization, but if y'all don't, and there's an article that you need to access just behind a paywall, um, you can just let me know and I can likely access it through you um, using my university system. Um, and then lastly, you'll just need email to communicate with me and send in your materials. So the benefits of this project is that you're helping horn lizard conservation in one of the best ways possible. So by educating people and especially children, um, you're helping to inspire people to love and protect horn lizards and you're creating future generations of conservationists. And you yourself will also gain a better understanding of the horn lizards of Texas and their conservation needs um, by doing research to prepare the educational materials. So the Horn Lizard Conservation Society desperately needs your help. Uh, we're working on expanding our education and outreach efforts. So creating these materials definitely supports that uh, focus. Um, like I said, we're a volunteer run organization and usually it's just a, a couple of us board members that are creating new educational materials. So your talents and your fresh ideas will be deeply appreciated, appreciated and beneficial to our mission. Um, and the project also ties with uh, the mission of the Texas Master Naturalist um, to promote education and outreach on conservation issues and two of the three horn lizards in Texas, the Texas horn lizard and the greater short horn lizard um, are currently listed as species of greatest conservation need. Um, so you can contact me best via my personal email, which is masonemily3 at gmail.com. Um, but if you forget that, um, you can also contact me via our general inquiry email, which is hornlizardinfo at gmail.com. Um, that one you might get a bit of a slower response on because our secretary checks it fairly infrequently um, during the horn lizard's hibernation season. And if you want to check out our current educational offerings to see what we currently have, you can visit our website at hornlizards.org. Um, if you want to look at the educational posts that we've made in the past on social media, um, you can check out our Facebook, which is Horn Lizard Conservation Society, um, or our Instagram, which is just Horn Lizard Conservation. And then we also have a selection of educational videos on our YouTube, Horn Lizard Conservation Society, if you're interested in making it a different kind of educational video. Okay. Uh, with that, I can take any questions. Awesome, Mason. Thank you so much. Um, I don't see any in the chat, um, Dude, surprisingly. Question. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, uh, I had one question that came in specifically. Um, Mason, what um, what guidelines are provided for the various types of materials that you're requesting? 
Um, we really don't have any guidelines besides usually using current research. Um, we really, it's, it's just kind of open to your creativity and what you have planned. Um, like I said, it does need to be submitted to us to be approved before we post it. Um, so if there's anything we might, you know, have suggestions for, we can get back to you on that. And then there's also a request in the chat to, um, to share your email address again. Um, oh, sure. As a reminder to all Master National Song Line as well, um, all of our project hosts' contact information is in the catalog uh, for today's virtual volunteer fair. And I'm going to copy that into the link into the chat as well so that that's easily accessible. I realize that some folks can't access it until um, they've closed out of WebEx just for capacity, but um, please know that all that information is also in that document. Okay. Thank you. Mason just posted her email in the chat as well for everybody. Thank you. Um, so I guess, um, again, thank you for sharing your information with us today, uh, Mason, and hopefully you'll get plenty of volunteers your way. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce um, our next speaker and our last one for today, um, Wendy Anderson with Texas Parks and Wildlife. And Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. And your top topic is going to be Texas Parks and Wildlife, Texas Ecological Analytical Mapper User Testing, a ground to truth. Oh, goodness. I'm sabotaging this. Sorry. Ground truth <laughs> or tool. That's a tongue twister. It um, is a tongue twister. Yes. And I do see your screen up. Um, All right. Let me know if you have any issues on your end. Um, it is a tongue twister, the title of my program today, um, but we will get to know what this means and hopefully I can attract you to volunteer for us. Like uh, she said, my name is Wendy Anderson. I work for the Landscape Ecology Program with Texas Parks and Wildlife. And I'm going to be talking about our volunteer opportunities today, which is to provide user testing feedback on an app we have and also doing grassland ground truthing for us. Sorry, there's a little bit of a lag. Hold on one second. I am seeing your notes too, just so you know that. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, that should be better. Yes. So the landscape ecology program at Texas Parks and Wildlife is looking for volunteers to test our Texas ecological analytical mapper, which I will lovingly refer to as team from now on, because that is a mouthful, and our team go app, which is our mobile version of the Texas ecological analytical mapper. We want to have users test our interactive mapping tool. And um, this tool is free, no download required. You can use it in Chrome on any computer. And additionally, for user for volunteers who attend our training session for doing user testing, you can att uh, attend additional and optional volunteer training to provide grassland feedback. So just as a little bit of a background on team. Oh, sorry. It is a statewide map of all of the habitats of Texas. If even if you don't volunteer with us, I encourage you to go check out team. It is user friendly, free, and it provides a lot of high quality data for for land managers, master naturalists alike. You can either go to this URL or just simply Google team. Within team, you can create automated reports. And so this is a map of McKinney Falls and all of the different habitats and a list of all of the different habitats. And each of those lists goes to a link which goes in, in depth into the description of those habitats with description of landforms, geology, plants, and e uh, ecosystem information. For volunteers that wish to help us, I would expect you to go to our app, use the app and specifically the ground truthing tool within our team application and tell us what your experience was like. Were there any errors? Was there anything that was really hard to understand or confusing? And I wanna hear if there's anything we can do to improve the app. So you would be filling out this PDF right here and then sending it to our landscape ecology email. So the benefit for you is um, 
that you will be gaining experience with geographic information science and you will be able to produce ecological reports for public and private lands for future use. This project is needed because it's a necessary step to make our apps user friendly and approachable and it will improve the accessibility to free ecological data for the public and volunteers will be providing essential feedback to improve the user experience for our team apps. You will be the first volunteers to provide input and feedback and your feedback will likely result in the direct improvements of the application. We can basically handle an infinite number of volunteers. Um, volunteers can work at your own leisure at any time on a computer or on a phone. Um, you can work as many hours as you would like and I understand that there are some regions that don't have as many volunteer opportunities right now so i encourage you to take advantage of this opportunity to get in as many hours as you can they are at your own pace and at your own leisure you can do it on your couch volunteers will need experience using a computer and web browsers and understanding maps you don't have to have experience with gis i will be walking you through it step by step you will need to have a web browser and the chrome web web browser is recommended and you'll be using it on a personal computer or a smart device and you don't have to download any applications for this. I will be providing one hour of additional training for these team user testing volunteers and I will run three virtual sessions. You are only required to attend one, but you're welcome to attend as many as you'd like. I will set up two weekday hour sessions and one weekend session in February and in March. And I'm also going to go over our grassland ground truthing volunteer opportunity. So this is an optional and additional opportunity if you are volunteering with us to do user testing. So the expectations for this is to update our mapping system and make sure that our grasslands are correctly identified. So you can see it if you're looking at the PowerPoint, there is a picture of a golf course on the right and in our Ecological mapping systems, we have it categorized as Blackland Prairie and sadly golf courses are not native Blackland Prairie. So this is just an example of an incorrectly mapped grassland that we want volunteers to help update. So what you would do is you would go out at your own leisure on your own time anywhere where there's grasslands and I want you to go out into the field and ground truth and verify that the grassland identification is correct. So you would provide a dominant land cover, dominant species, percent woody coverage, and you would take a picture of that grassland and upload it to our tool. And I will explain how to do all of this. This project is needed to help improve the accuracy of our mapped grassland ecosystems. Grasslands are extremely hard to identify from satellite imagery. So it's really essential that we have volunteers to help us make sure that our data is correct. And your ground truthing data will have your name on it, just like any submission on iNaturalist, and you can brag about it. Once it is approved by us, your input will directly change the team data set for the world to see. Through this volunteer opportunity with grassland ground truthing, you will improve your GIS skills, grassland ecology, and grassland plant ID. And just as a further way to convince you to be involved with this project, um, I did this for the first two years with TPWD, and if you are not in love with grasslands, you owe it to yourself to fall in love with grasslands. This will be an opportunity to spend time in nature, get to know your local flora and fauna, generate a sense of place around you, practice your nature photography while helping our program's mission to provide free and high quality data. Similarly, we can handle an infinite number of volunteers, but I would assume maybe 50 people are going to be interested. Um, the grassland truthing must happen during the day and not during the winter when plants are senesced. So any volunteers who are south of Austin, you could probably get started with this mid-March and anyone who is north of Austin might be later March, April. You can do this at your leisure as much as you want, and it, it is an ongoing effort with no end date. Ecosystems are constantly changing throughout Texas, so we will always need to be updating our maps. We would expect maybe one to 10 hours per month and as many hours as you would like to commit and hours are flexible at your own pace, at your own leisure. And for this volunteer experience for the grassland ground truthing, you need experience with a computer or a phone, web browser, understanding maps, and some basic plant ID experience. I will be going over plant ID in our additional training. I will provide one hour of advanced training for this opportunity. 
where we will go over grassland ecology and grassland plant ID. And I will provide two sessions for this, one weekday and one weekend, dates to be determined, and I will work with volunteers to find the best dates possible. So if you are interested in helping us, you are welcome to indicate that on the survey that is provided in the chat, and you can also email us for further information. And with that, I will open this up to questions. Thank you so much, Wendy. Um, there is one that says, uh, can we go and quote play on it multiple times in order to beta test if multiple times? Absolutely. Beta multiple times. Okay. Yes, as much as you want. And um, let's see, uh, will you also be identifying absence of grassland where it was on the mapping? Yes, anywhere that there is errors, whether it's the incorrect type of grassland or we have labeled it as grassland and it's not grassland or we've labeled it as a forest and someone has burned all of the trees and turned it into a lush grassland, we need to know all of that information. So that happens continuously throughout the state of Texas as ecosystem change and turnover. Okay, those are the only two I have unless uh, Mary Pearl has anything yeah, I've else. I've a few that have come in directly um, that are related, I believe. Uh, Donna asked, did you say that we can work on the data for our local state park? And then maybe you can work anywhere that you want. Um, private property, public property, um, anywhere in the state of Texas. That, that follows up with Mary Jane's and Lisa's question, private and pri public versus private for collecting Great. data. Well, thank you so much everyone for sticking around for my presentation at the end of this day, a two day presentation. So thank you so much. Thank you, Wendy. We really appreciate you sharing your content and your project with us. Thank you so much, Wendy. Um, I just want to thank I just want to thank all of our speakers once again, um, if you're still on. Um, everybody has been amazing sharing their projects, and I just wanted to also highlight five projects uh, from Kathy Smith, who was unable to join us today and yesterday um, with Village Creek State Park. So uh, she does have five different projects associated with her park, and um, we would definitely uh, want to make sure everybody looks at that to see if those are opportunities that you'd like to participate in as well. And with that, I will uh, bat it over to Mary Pearl with any conclusion that she wants to share with us. Wrapping it up. Yeah, so we have a um, question in um, the chat asking about the recording from yesterday. And it is up on our website now. Um, it's actually up yesterday. So recordings are available. And then as soon as this recording is done and done processing, we'll get that posted on the website as well. For anyone yeah, so who wants just a to quick check reference in. to the Quick reference to the website as well. Um, you'll go to the virtual volunteer fair uh, button that's on the home screen of the website. That'll remain there for at least the next month. Um, if not, it'll be found um, in under naturalist news, that tab at the top. You'll find it in the catalog of, of news articles um, and go to the virtual volunteer fair page, scroll down, and the recording from yesterday is already posted. The recording from today will be posted right here underneath that agenda item. And then there's additional information on here with um, how do I sign up to volunteer, that survey monkey link that we have shared here um, in the chat every day. And then how do I log hours? There's a quick guide for VMS um, here as well, as well as the catalog of projects that we've referenced a few times today is downloadable here. I would like to also just, I, I didn't mention this earlier, but I would like to thank all of the participants, all the master naturalists who, who joined us these past two days for uh, listening to all these different projects and joining the different speakers. Um, and, um, and thank you again for taking the time out and uh, looking for opportunities to help a lot of these various organizations and agencies. Um, so hopefully you'll find something that uh, you can join and uh, help out with. Judith, I want to say thank you for your facilitation. You were great today and yesterday. She always is. Absolutely. Big thank you, Judith. Really appreciate your help on this project. Last year and this year. All 
All right, with that, I'm going to stop the recording.